Uh, okay, I'm going to start asking questions um, of the panel. I want to introduce them first. Um, each of them spoke today. We have Brenda Davis, who will also be speaking again on um, Monday night. Dr. Joel Furman, who spoke this afternoon. Anna Marie Clement, who spoke this morning. And Brian Clement, who spoke this afternoon, who will also be speaking again tomorrow. So uh, Brian, I think, is speaking at 11 tomorrow, and Dr. Furman at 2 tomorrow. So um, I'd like to ask you some questions. And uh, I want to point out just quickly that in some ways, I consider this an insane situation. In other words, we're having a conference. So many people consider the information here voluntary. Like, you know, no big deal. If I learn this, I learn it. If not, what's the big deal? And um, I consider it kind of crazy because people all the time out of nowhere say things like, oh, I have uh, my thyroid's no good anymore. I have diabetes. I have a serious illness. And they don't trace, and they think, you know, maybe it's genetic. What I'm saying is, instead of one day waking up and going to a doctor and finding out that some part of you is broken, don't wait. Right this second, these people on this panel have spent their lives researching this. And as I searched the country for authors and books to find people that really have this down, they've spent their life finding this information out to offer it to you and your friends and family. And you can listen or you can ignore, ignore it, but I feel... Unfortunately, if we ignore it, it doesn't work out that good. So I hope everyone will take to heart what they say, understand how much research has been done, and I'm excited to ask some questions now. Um, let me just read a quick thing. Um, this conference provides general information on a broad range of health topics for education purposes only. It does not provide medical advice, professional diagnosis, opinion, treatment, or services to you or to any other individual. The information provided during this conference is not a substitute for medical or professional care, and you should not use the information in place of a visit, call, consultation, or the advice of your physician or other healthcare provider. Attending this conference does not create a physician-patient relationship with any of the speakers that are doctors. If you believe you have any other health problem or if you have any questions regarding your health or medical condition, you should promptly consult your physician or other healthcare provider. Never disregard medical or professional advice or delay seeking it because of something you heard during this conference. Never rely on information from this conference in place of seeking professional medical advice. You should also ask your physician or other healthcare provider to assist you in interpreting any information from this conference or linked websites or in applying this information to your individual case. Medical information changes constantly. Therefore, the information provided during this conference should not be considered current, complete, or exhaustive, nor should you rely on such information to recommend a course of treatment for you or any other individual. Um, <laughs> okay, so I realize that we could, on, on any question, we could take up the entire time. On any question, we could, each of you could spend an hour speaking. So I would like to think of this, that we're trying to spend three minutes total on a question. So everyone doesn't have to answer every question. But the goal would be to try to spend three minutes. If you feel one person answered it well, no need to comment. If you want to add anything, please feel free. OK, first question. Um, Brian Clement just, re just recently re released a book called Poison Poultry about the chicken industry. Um, should we eat chicken? <laughs> That's what the whole book is about. <laughs> so I'll start, and then I'll pass it down. Uh, as appalling as I perceived the so-called organic poultry industry was, it was a lot worse when I delved into it. Uh, there's no such thing as organic poultry, organic eggs, free-range eggs. Uh, that it's all a, a facade that literally is precipitated by dishonest industry. Uh, here in the United States, unlike maybe some other nations, we don't have one employee that works for the government that checks these places. It's self-regulated by a, a bad industry. Uh, they made a ruling to call a free-range chicken a free-range chicken. You just require at the same factory farm the building that says organic on it to open the window up 30 minutes a day. This is a fact. Challenge anything I say. Uh, we found out that there's an average of 15% more deaths in the so-called cageless egg uh, buildings because the poor little chickens are walking on top of one another. The ones that urinate at the top, it comes down, they die of poisoning, ammonia poisoning at the bottom. And I mean, it, it's, just, it's just something that makes yuppies feel better when they go to the market and buy this food. Get over it, yuppies. You don't need chicken. 
And as I pointed out, and I'll do deeply tomorrow in my conference on poison poultry, uh, my, my colleague who's now passed on, Dr. Virginia Livingston, spent more than six decades of her life showing us that poultry, out of all the flesh that people eat, all the animal foods that people eat, caused more cancer than any other flesh. Dairy is the only thing that supersedes it. Dr. Livingston, I presume? Yes, Dr. Livingston. <laughs> <laughs> the real one. <laughs> okay. Over the last 40 years, um, you've seen a lot of people who've lived on the Atkins, Paleo, or lo other low-carb diets. What have the short and long-term results been for the people who followed this diet? Anyone. Any, anyone who wants to comment on that? Anyone. Oh, I could start. <laughs> Basically, you know, I've been in practice for approximately 28 years now, and I've seen many people get into trouble following various fads and hypotheses that they're, you know. However, we have to give more credence to studies that track thousands of people, and they follow thousands of people for decades. And the studies, we give more credence that use hard endpoints. The hard endpoints are things like death, cardiovascular <laughs> events like heart attacks, or cancer diagnoses have more credence than a study that's just checking weight or checking cholesterol. We can show any study, short-term study, we can show a Twinkie diet is beneficial if we, by losing weight and lowering your cholesterol, if we feed per people less calories and they get sick of eating just Twinkies and they consume less calories, the point I'm making is we need to give more credence to long-term studies. And we do that. We follow people, and we have these studies that are published in the medical literature today, that follow thousands of people. Like, a, for example, one study followed 6,000 <coughs> people for 18 years, and they had 400% um, they had increased death, in the uh, increased cancer death in those people eating higher amounts of animal products, 30% of calories compared to those eating less than 10% of calories. It's one study, but I can name, I can name multiple studies scores of them that show that as animal protein increases in the diet, so do both cancer deaths car and cardiovascular deaths and overall mortality. So I think that um, the question about paleo-type diets that are generally high in animal products and other, what was the other diet you mentioned? Atkins. And the Atkins diet, yeah. I think that's not a question that really is, in, is controversial anymore. I think that it's true that they're still popular. It's true that a lot of people are doing it. But I think among nutritional scientists, even the World Health Organization, and, and at least 90% of people into um, human nutrition who've read most of the, who follow the literature, I don't think among nutritional research there's any controversy see, at all left that these diets shorten human lifespan. And I'll just add a little bit to that. Is my mic? Oh, there it is. Um, my presentation on Monday is about uh, the Paleolithic diet and a lot of the claims and what we know in the research that uh, Dr. Furman was talking about. Um, but just to add a little bit to that, uh, we, we have uh, literally dozens and dozens of studies, as you were saying, and one that was quite convincing, I think it was 2013, a study out of Harvard that followed people doing these kinds of low-carb diets for a number of years. And I, if I'm not mistaken, I think it was 50 some percent increase in mortality, and or or w one or the other, one 51 percent, and then 34 percent or something increase in heart disease deaths. Uh, and and so long term, what you're doing when you're eating that kind of diet is you're you're making your body um, more acidic, more prone to kidney stones and kidney disease, and of course to cardiovascular disease. And so I think a lot of people, what they care about is weight loss. Um, and in a, a culture where you've got, uh, you know, at least 70% of people are overweight or obese, and if you go with Dr. Furman's uh, numbers of under, a BMI of under 23, 88%, as you were saying today, um, and, and people go on a diet where they're eating mostly meat and a little bit of non-starchy vegetables as these many of these diets uh, suggest, of course they're going to lose weight. They've just cut out uh, all of the processed white flour products and the burgers and the pizza. and it, they've, they've cut all, all of that out, so of course they're going to lose weight. When you lose weight, you start to feel better. And um, what they're not recognizing, this, it's sort of long-term pain for short-term gain, really, is, 
is, is kind of what, what you're doing when you, when you adopt this type of diet. But one, for those of you that can't be at the paleo presentation, I just want to tell you that, that even if these diets were the healthiest diets, bar none, um, you know, a diet really is only as healthy as um, it is good for the, the planet and, and our, our population and for other creatures and for biodiversity and so on. If every single person on the, on the, on the face of the earth ate a paleo diet, uh, today we would need 15 planet Earths to sustain the current population. It's insanity. Uh, and, you know, we just, we really have to look, as I was saying earlier today, we've got to look at the consequences of our choices beyond ourselves. We've got to start to do this. I want to add that uh, one uh, hot dog increases the risk of colon cancer, right? One hot dog. And so you, it's about the microbes, it's about the bacteria flora. You, as soon as you start eating meat, it, let's say you were a vegan and you ate only plant-based, you actually changed the bacteria flora and now you are increasing the risk for colon cancer big time. And this has been in studies, we know that for sure a vegan bacteria flora does not promote colon cancer. So it's very much about changing the microbes and the bacteria. And you, you're actually inviting subpopulations that the, the bad guys come in, the amoebas, the E. coli, and all kinds of uh, bacteria that should not be there. We have a lot of friendly bacteria, and if I'm not in a good place, please take, a, take really good probiotic and enzymes to get you there. I certainly think five planet Earths are sufficient. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe Earths without humans are really sufficient. <laughs> <laughs> I saw all of your lectures today, and I thought they were great. I thought they seemed very scientific, and I, you guys seem very intelligent. I'm very impressed. But the problem is the United States Department of Agriculture, the USDA, is saying something different from you. And it seems like they probably would know more than you. I mean, they're the United States Department of Agriculture. I assume it's the <laughs> smartest people with the most experience. Um, my uncle reads it, and, you know, if the USDA says something, it seems like they would have the best, smartest people. So what, you know, how do we rectify that you're saying one thing that's different? The USDA is saying I should have dairy and cheese. Who should we believe? Like, Why should we think that you're accurate as opposed to them? Well, I th uh, my opinion is I think we should, should not have a good guy, bad guy view, uh, cowboy and Indian view, uh, black and white view of any of this stuff. That you have to understand that there's vested interest behind what I do and behind what the people at the agricultural department does. Uh, my vested interest is to bring truth and history and science and 62 years of experience at Hippocrates to the public. Their view is to regurgitate in their work what they learned at university at the agricultural school they went to. And remember, this is a revolving door between the agricultural community, Monsanto's, etc., and working for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. It's the same thing with the FDA. It's a revolving door between they and the pharmaceutical industry and the food industry. And uh, the most interesting conversation I had was uh, at a conference similar to this in front of physicians years ago when I met Dr. Kessler, who I really wasn't that fond of. I like everyone. I didn't like him very much. He was a former head of the FDA, and he came up to me and said, I used to think guys like you were quacks no more. Uh, I said, why did you lose, uh, leave the FDA? He said, because it was so corrupt I couldn't take another day. And he was an honest, good doctor who basically wanted the best for people, and I knew it because now what he's doing is working on childhood obesity which scares me more than all the other things when it comes to disease uh, that we've talked about today. Because if you think we're sick, you wait. You just wait until the next generation that are over 70% overweight, obese, or morbidly obese. So I don't think they have to be looked at as the bad guys. We're the good guys. I think it's knowledge, wisdom, and we've got to find a way to change the economy. Like Russia fell not because Ronald Reagan and America made them fall. They ran out of money. So if we say no to the people who are 
on the march for death, dying, and disease and cut off the money by saying we're not going to buy those products, I promise you, there won't be a war. It's going to be Mahatma Gandhi all over again. And we're going to end up everyone living this way. Um, I know that all of you do a lot of research. So should we consider the information we get on health, <coughs> nutrition, diet, and medicine from the scientific studies accurate? Like if it says in the paper there was a scientific study done or you know, it was quoted in the newspaper, um, is that accurate or is there someone's financial interest behind it? Like how do you decide when you see a study whether you decide to accept it as credible or you decide that it was an industry-funded study <coughs> and therefore you don't give it credence? of experience and education to know how to interpret studies. But basically, we did learn that um, years ago, most of the studies were done by medical schools and independent authorities. But in today's, in the last 50 years, almost all the studies on drugs, for example, are paid for by the drug manufacturers themselves. And, they're, and they can publish the ones that they feel are favorable and not publish the ones that are unfavorable. We already know that most of the studies produced in this country are not um, excellent science, the let me say this one more time, that the majority of studies in medical journals are not non-biased. They are definitely biased and almost all doctors recognize that and are taught that as well. And that's why they have independent um, research groups like the Cochrane Analysis, an, um, a Scandinavian group that looks at studies on mammograms or on the, or flu vaccines or on antibiotics for um, strep throats because they're not tied with the drug industry. They're not the drug industry paying for the study, and they can give you, because we know in this country the American Cancer Society is financially tied to the mammogram um, companies, and we know that this, and all these things are based on, um, on economic benefit to the producers of the, of the, um, to the medical profession or the pharmaceutical companies. So the, the real reality is that we have to see who publishes the study, whether it's a, um, whether the analysis is called a meta-analysis, we're pooling many studies together. What are the studies in the pooled studies? How long are we talking about? Whether the studies are short-term studies, where they go on long enough to see the long-term dangers of a particular program, including medications. We know that um, we, we, medications are on the market for 20 years before we really fully recognize the dangers associated with them. And most medications eventually get pulled off the market after they're around for decades and decades because we find out they're dangerous as we put them on the market early on so we can, so there's much to be skeptical of in the scientific literature. And evidence-based medicine is basing your decisions on very scant evidence. <laughs> so we really have to be selective in what we're accepting as valuable evidence and that takes some training and knowledge to be able to how to interpret studies and to recognize who's done the study, who's paid for it, when, and, and other factors we're discussing. So a good example is the, is whether, um, is the fact that, in spite of the fact that, let's say, um, the American task force or, or the preventive medicine task force no longer recommends mammograms between, let's say, the ages of 40 and 50, it's still recommended by other groups because they're affiliated with the mammogram companies and too much outcry and, and protest about people not making money on them and women want them because they're so brainwashed since birth that it's gonna save lives. So it, everything is political and social and, and, and with our government too, this is a political system. And, we, and it represents what the majority of people believe. And the studies are set up to support what people want to do and, what, and where the economic um, interests lie. And as you were saying, and as you were saying, Brian, as, as our society changes and many more people are demanding different type of care and different type of um, evidence, and di then we'll have government with electing officials and we'll have doctors who are more, or have practices that support what the populations want. But the change has to come from the mass of people educating themselves it's not going to come from the, um, the, the economically and politically powerful who want to maintain the status quo. Not usually. That's not usually the case. It's certainly not going to come from within the medical profession itself because they're entrenched in what they're doing at the med present to make a living. And I'd, I'd like to add a, a, a few things. One, uh, just getting back to the USDA and, and some of the, the governing bodies that develop nutrition policy, and just to recognize that a lot of the scientific advisory boards um, actually do a really good job. Uh, they, they're looking at the science, 
And then once the um, interests of industry, uh, you know, they get their voices in, the, the, it, things change a little bit by the time it comes to the public because the agricultural, of course, USDA is a voice for farmers. They're also a voice for scientists. And to try to please everybody, there's going to be compromises. And unfortunately, those compromises sometimes mean, mean a compromise in the, in the bottom line final message. But do, do be aware, the USDA Nutrient Database is a wonderful resource. Uh, they have, um, the USDA has really uh, quite excellent summaries of, of nutrients and professional summaries and consumer summaries. There, there are some resources that are really quite e exceptional and so it's important to, to recognize that. And then in terms of scientific literature, <coughs> well we have to be evidence-based in what we say. W what are we using to be evidence-based? It's got to be scientific studies and of course as Dr. Furman was saying, we, we need to be somewhat selective, but we also need to recognize that what you see in the headlines is not always what the scientists were trying to say in their papers. And I'm going to give you an example because I think this is really important for you to understand. So in 2014, a meta-analysis came out by Chowd Hurry et al. Ch you know, this was a meta-analysis about saturated fats and uh, there are effects on, on cardiovascular disease risk. And basically, the chowd hurry trial showed saturated fat intake, I mean, th this is what the researchers you know, ended up saying, didn't really have an influence on cardiovascular disease risk. And so, of course, the headlines were, butter is back, uh, you know, eat, eat all the lard you want. It was just, <laughs> it, it, basically, that's, that's what the media took from those studies. So, I, I'm looking at this study, and, and there were so many flaws, so many flaws that, you know, Walter Willett from Harvard and his team came out with sort of a list of the flaws, and they were comparing people who were consuming, you know, within countries, similar amounts of saturated fats with people consuming just slightly more saturated fats, so there wasn't going to be a huge difference in the risk, but <coughs> if they compared between populations, there were huge differences. Like the people from Japan, their saturated fat intake ranged from, I can't remember if it was four to seven percent versus the people in, you know, in some of the European countries, 12 or 14 percent. And the risk in, in cardiovascular disease was just absolutely hugely different. But the story I want to tell you is I noticed the third author on that trial was a lady by the name of Francesca Crow. And if you're familiar with Epic Oxford, the Epic Oxford studies that followed the, you know, the, the cohort that had about a third of the people vegetarian and vegan, she's one of the key authors. She was the author on the cataract study, I believe, that, that showed 40% um, you know, lower risk in, in vegans. And she, she did a lot of Epic Oxford. She was involved in a lot of Epic Oxford, and I thought, it just didn't make sense to me that she was involved in that study. So I contacted her, and I said, you know, Dr. Crow, um, what is, uh, how are you explaining the findings of this study? And she said, well, first of all, I was quite involved in this study uh, uh, until uh, I, I think she moved. Uh, and then it, she said, we actually, we actually uh, submitted the study to a journal. And what our findings were is that people eating the most saturated fat had about a 19% increased risk of cardiovascular disease relative to those eating, you know, high, higher amounts. And she said, our study was turned down because it didn't show anything new. Uh, so we've always known saturated fat increases LDL and it increases risk of heart disease. So what the, what the uh, senior author did was he reworked the data, removed certain things until he got a different outcome. <laughs> which was showing no difference. And so she said it was resubmitted to another journal, and she said she only found out about it a week before it was actually released, and she had no ability to change anything, but she said what you need to know is this study changes nothing about what we've known about saturated fat and heart disease for 50 plus years. The clinical research is very clear. Saturated fat intake increases LDL and increases risk of cardiovascular disease, P. 
period. And she was one of the authors of that study. So just so you know, even when the media comes out with these big pronouncements, uh, it's, you really have to understand that they don't necessarily understand uh, the findings of these scientific studies, and they're not always clear. So what that study actually showed was if you replace, and what many studies that have suggested saturated fat isn't an issue, all they're really showing is if you replace saturated fat with refined carbohydrates, you are at no, uh, you have no improved risk of cardiovascular disease. Refined carbohydrates and saturated fats are not much different in, uh, different in terms of your risk of heart disease. Well, I'll just say one last thing. Pertinent to this conversation, in 1988, uh, here in the United States, which by the way, in 1988, we led the world. What America science gave, the world followed. We actually were going to radically change the food pyramid. Matter of fact, the Congress said this is it. And they were about ready to tell people to eat plant-based diets. This was extremely clear. The meats and the dairies triturated to the bottom. The vegetables and fruits went to the top. The grains went above the meats. And they halted it. The industry stepped in. The lobbyists stepped in in 1988. I think it was going to be published in January. And they halted it till April. It came back. And it was pretty much the same old thing with a few token vegetables thrown in on top of it. So. I happen to agree with both of them. I think the thing that I, Anna Marie and I read the most is meta-studies where there's been 10, 20, 30, 50, 100 studies, and then you sort of see the thread that is equal among them, and then maybe there's some semblance of truth in this. Not always, <laughs> maybe. Uh, we like studies that agree with what we did. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. We all have vested interests. <laughs> all my books I support with studies that I like. <laughs> I just want to say one more thing, because uh, in Canada, uh, we are just on the cusp of a new food guide and new nutrition oh. recommendations, and uh, they are very strongly plant-based. Oh, that's And so the industry right now is having their say and, and not very happy with sort of what the final version is. So we shall see mm -hmm. if the same thing happens. But there are many, many people on, you know, that have been writing to the government to say, please do not change a thing. So it, keep your uh, ears tuned. We you, may have quite You make sure cherries at the top of that pyramid. Uh, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so um, in 2015, <coughs> we had a conference, and Dr. Furman spoke. He gave two lectures. One of them has 175,000 views on YouTube. One has 200,000. Brenda Davis gave a lecture that has 75,000 views. Brian and Marie have given many lectures that have tens of thousands of views each. A lot of people have seen this stuff. And I've showed these to a lot of people. And I say, you know, what do you think? And very often they go, that was fantastic. That was amazing information. And I say, okay, great. What, so are you going to change anything? And they say, well, I spoke to my nutritionist or my dietitian or my doctor, <laughs> and they said something else. And I said, so what are you going to do? They said, well, I'm going to listen to my nutritionist or dietitian. So I'm wondering, you know, should people listen to their, I mean, okay, so. Should you, when someone says I spoke to a nutritionist or I spoke to a dietitian or I spoke to a doctor about diet, um, should they s assume that person is qualified, trained? I mean, wh wh how should they interpret the word dietitian and nutritionist? It has a lot of weight. People respect it. What should they make of it? Because it seems like most nutritionists and dietitians, I don't know if most but many, are not recommending what you're saying. They're saying that fish and chicken is fine. So uh, just so everybody is clear and understands, a dietitian um, has to do an undergraduate a degree program that is, at least, in, at least in Canada, I think it's the same in the States, four years, plus an internship or a master's. And as of next year, I believe it will be a master's. And so it's for at least uh, five to six years of, of uh, post-secondary education. So there, and, and training in, assessing you know, scientific studies and so forth. However, there still is a fairly big influence of industry on the profession. And I can remember when I was in university, and this is, you know, what, 35 or so years ago, uh, we were actually courted by the dairy and meat industries. Uh, they gave us free 
uh, educational materials to use in our practices, uh, free little courses after, you know, after hours at school. They, they provided us with all sorts of beautiful things. They still fund a lot of our annual, you know, meetings and our nutrition month and so on and so forth. Ventures proposed to you? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, so, so there is some influence, but just know this, that just as there are specialists within the medical profession, there are specialists within the dietetic profession. And what I'm seeing is more and more dietitians <laughs> or registered dietitians who have tremendous interest in plant-based nutrition. And there, there is an actually a practice group within the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics with probably at least 1,500 members that are vegetarian or vegan dietitians or have great interest in that realm. So when you're seeking out a dietitian or nutritionist, it's, I think it's really important to find out what their area of specialty is and what their sort of bias is. And if you're looking for someone who's more plant-based, uh, to be looking for that and to understand that mo the average dietitian, like the average physician, is still recommending what we consider a, you know, sort of balanced diet that includes foods from all of the food groups and so on and so forth, but there, you do have options and there are Many more. I'm, you know, when I when I became vegan th uh, 30 years ago, I honestly thought I was the only vegetarian dietitian on the planet. I'd never <laughs> met another one. You may I have really, been. I, 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 yeah, I had never, and I was terrified. I thought I was going to be ousted from the profession when they found out I was. I, wa I was eliminating two of the four food groups. You know, so it was it was scary. And and but I can still remember thinking to myself. If I don't stay and try to affect change within my profession, who will? You know, I knew I had to have the courage to stay. And so what I did was just I made sure all my I's were dotted and my T's were crossed and that I could back up with, you know, evidence-based research everything I was saying. I got very familiar with the World Health Organization resources and I became a strong voice. And, and so before I knew it, I was being invited to speak at dietetic association conferences all over the world. And, and I was able to teach my fellow dietitians more about plant-based diets. And, and so it all worked out really well. As a matter of fact, my writing partner, Vasanto Molina, just won the highest award offered by Dietitians of Canada. And a vegetarian dietitian that was here earlier today, Rita, um, is it Bethesda? I, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing her last name right, but she just won the highest award offered by the Academy of Nutrition um, and Dietetics in the United States. And so things are changing. It, there, it's, it's quite hopeful. Um, and so just a little bit of positive news there, I think. Yeah. But I would say generally the education that any of us received, Anna dragged me back way back when I was 50, to get my doctorate degree in nutrition. And we spent three and a half years studying day and night and on planes and everything. And frankly, when we took our final exam, I had to lie on half the test to pass it. Because if I didn't lie, I would have failed after three and a half years of hard work getting this degree, this diploma. So it's what we're learning at school. We have to have imaginations. We have to have uh, interest to move beyond what we were taught. Dr. Furman did. He didn't learn a thing about nutrition at school. From his practice, by the way, he basically started to think wisely, hey, maybe diet and nutrition has something to do with it. He didn't learn a thing. I frankly was told when I was going, going for that education that you had to take milk. And so can you imagine? This is what they're teaching. It wasn't, you know, a thousand years ago. We're talking 20 years ago this happened. And it's also what dietitian and nutritionists are expected to say because some of them come to our institute and they say, you know, I wish I could give these advices, but I'm not expected to give these advice. So that's too. Why are people asking their physicians for nutritional advice anyway? Yeah, exactly. Why don't you ask your um, mailman? Yes. <laughs> Probably knows more. <laughs> you know about the same amount, but regardless of that, there's going to be a broad spectrum of opinion among mailmen. 
<laughs> either female, and there'll be a broad spectrum of opinion among the legal profession and among doctors who have all different viewpoints. So you just happen to have one doctor, you're asking for his viewpoint. Just go ask anybody else you know. It's the same, it's not anything that you should base your life on it. They're not highly educated in this field. They didn't dedicate their life to reviewing thousands of studies. We've reviewed maybe 50,000 studies on nutrition before we come to our recommendations. They don't have any time. It's not their specialty. Why would you ask them for their opinion? I can remember the first time I ever spoke to a group of medical doctors. It was probably, I don't know, 30 years ago. And, and I was really nervous because doctors know so much. And I thought, oh, it's going to, you know, it's just going to be challenging to speak in front of them. And at the end of the, the talk, I was absolutely shocked at the questions they were asking me. Uh, they asked me, but don't cashews have cholesterol? Um, and of course, I thought to myself, did you not take grade 11 biology? <laughs> and, and then they, one doctor said, well, you know that, that orange juice that you buy and that's frozen in that little can? Is that real orange juice? <laughs> and and then I'm, I'm not trying to be condescending, but I, I, it was just what I learned there was that the questions they were asking were not any different than the questions I would have received from a general public audience. And it was at that point I realized that they're hungry for nutrition information exactly. and they, they haven't received a lot in the past. So. And of course, we can put in a plug for the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. Yeah. What I was a founding member when there were 40 of us and now there's 8,000 or more people. They've Is it 8,000? Well, I think it's more than that. They've doubled wow. in their attendance you know, each wow. year for many, many years now. And, um, and so there's a lot of physicians that just like the general population is expanding, there are mo it's so rewarding to see so many physicians that you know call me up and thank me and are fans and they, they ask me for stuff and they buy my books in bulk, bulk and give it to their patients. So on the other hand, there are lots of doctors who are really excited about this, who legitimately want to do what's best for their patients and they very in a very, very um, touching and impressed by so many doctors who are trying their best to incorporate this information in their practice today. Um, Dr. Furman, you just wrote a book, uh, Fast Food Genocide. That's correct. And um, in, in the book, um, did, can, can people be actually be addicted to fast food, highly processed foods, and high sugar foods the same way they are to like some other addiction, like cigarettes or something? Absolutely. That was one of the main por points in the book, and that um, frankenfoods, these foods are designed to make become addictive and to make people into food addicts. And the, the um, what is word attic mean? It's the, it's the room above the bed, the, in your house, above the living room, the attic. You know. <laughs> but no, but, <laughs> no, but really the word no, but attic. the attic attic. The, <laughs> <laughs> but the word attic really means two things. It means, number one, that you get a, a strong, pleasurable sensation when you imbibe in that substance. And then when you don't have it, you feel some type of discomfort. And you try to avoid discomfort and the avoidance of discomfort once need has to have you seek that substance and that pleasure again. So it has a high and a low. And yes, food definitely gives you both, especially the more the food is unhealthy and the more the calories are concentrated and the, the faster the calories rush into the bloodstream, the more dopamine is stimulating the brain. The s and scientists have, uh, have discovered that the same stimulation of dopamine receptors occur when you take in cocaine or opiates as well as you're consuming you know, ice cream cone, for example. And when you stop consuming these highly processed, calorically dense foods, you also feel shaky and weak and pain and headachey and discomfort and fatigue and, and even anxiety. And so, they, so, it, it def so food is definitely addicting to the point where I'd have to say that the vast majority of Americans are food addicts. They can't contr totally control their ability to, to eat the right amount of calories because they're driven by food addiction and, w and we have a population that's mostly overweight and obese to prove it. People look in the mirror, they see they're 50 pounds overweight. They know that it can't be healthy to weigh, you know, to be eight, 50 to 80 pounds overweight. They're trying to go <coughs> on diets, but ought, they fail. It's difficult when you're an addict and you don't have the tools or the knowledge to get rid of those addictions. And that's really what I'm trying to teach. One thing I'm trying to teach people is giving them the knowledge and the tools to reverse food addiction and to get back in touch and to get their, get their health back, of course. What, what Joel said is absolutely correct. We're addicted to the so-called foods, the non-foods we consider foods, 
and the substance activity of the dopamine in the brain, but more nefarious than that, and listen closely, is that every major food industry, commercial food industry, uh, basically have teams of chemists on their payroll. Their entire job is to create synthetic opiates. Now challenge anything I ever say, because you're going to find out that this is factual. And so it wasn't bad enough that sugar is 20 times more addictive than cocaine. That's just the recent study that came out December the 10th or so. And in my book, Sweet Disease, I talk about the Princeton study you just referred to, where the brain lights up more so on sugar, all forms, including fruit sugar, uh, than it does on cocaine and heroin. But now we're telling you to add all of that together, we put dope in food. So your children, you, your friends, and it's called hyperpalatability. You may want to look that up on your computers. That's, and they have conventions once a year, and all the chemists get, the eggheads get together and see how they can dope you up quicker. And when I found this out, I go back to Dr. Kessler, and I asked him about it. I said, isn't that illegal? He said, no, these are not illicit substances. These are new chemicals that nobody has on the radar at this point. And even if they do challenge them and stop them from utilizing it, uh, they have a new one in the pipeline. If someone is going to have something sweet that has sugar in it, is there a significant advantage to making sure it's sweetened with sugar as opposed to high fructose corn syrup? Even if the answer is no sugar is better, if someone is choosing, should they make a significant effort to have sugar as opposed to high fructose corn syrup? Well, why don't you describe what high fructose corn syrup is? I'll, I'll do I don't, it. I don't, you can. I don't like the question. Uh, okay. Because I don't think it's a question of whether using, you know, One cocaine or guy. heroin, yeah, and who right, deciding right, which is worse. Right. It's still, I don't really get into that stuff. Well, you know, I don't want to get into that because they're both. If they're both things are very harmful to your health, why should we be condoning right. one over so another? He he's right about that. But high fructose corn syrup is genetically modified, so Monsanto had to do with that, and so the corn, 97% of the corn cultivated in your country, is genetically modified. So when they take the syrup, the sugar from that, it literally alters the brain, as Senef shows us with autism. Uh, you know, now there's finally lawsuits coming out from the legal profession against this, this type of pesticide. And this is really, really frightening stuff. So sugar is bad, but the added attraction is you'll get more cancer. You'll get more autism. Uh, and neurological problems by taking high fructose corn syrup, which they've now tricked you. They no longer call it high fructose corn syrup that has a target on it. It's called fructose. And I can show you it in health stores where they have that in foods, processed foods. And I'll, I'll just uh, say, basically, when you look at the scientific literature, um, sugar has a hugely detrimental effects to health. Fructose is similar, but the effects are more pronounced. Yeah. So you would develop non-alcoholic fatty liver disease more rapidly if most of the sugar you were consuming came in the form of fructose. The other thing that I was surprised, I'm trying to remember, I think it was 2009, a study came out showing that um, uh, probably about a third of the samples of, of uh, high fructose corn syrup actually contained uh, some mercury. And uh, one study showed as much as 0.57 micrograms per gram of corn syrup. And if you look at um, the uh, sort of the amount of corn syrup the average American is consuming, it's about uh, eight teaspoons or 34 grams uh, or so a day. And so if you, if, you know, if you do the math and then you look at what the EPA uh, suggests as a maximum intake of mercury, which is um, 0.1 microgram per kilogram body weight, if a person was taking in sort of the most contaminated corn syrup, um, they could actually be consuming around 20 micrograms of mercury a day. Actually, the EPA maximums, if you did the math, would be around five micrograms for a, for a, a 50 kilo or 110 pound person, and about 10 micrograms for a, a 100 kilo person or a a uh, 220 pound person. So, so it, theoretically, if you were getting the most contaminated corn syrup, you could actually exceed your mercury limits quite easily just by consuming the average amount of corn syrup. Uh, and that's not consuming any tuna fish or any other mercury containing food. So there's a, that's a, a, a concern as well. 
filter on my Mercury. <laughs> you and rub I'm it on. the same. <laughs> I, I use only dried fruits uh, as my, um, my sweetener, so I'll use a few dates. I dehydrate my own pears in the summertime. I like dehydrated pears for uh, sweet, you know, sweetening any sort of treat, and that's it. I, I don't think we have need for other sugars, really. I agree, of course, and also the more you sweeten your foods and the more you use sweeteners and even artificial sweeteners, it deadens your taste for sweet. Yeah. And it stimulates your appetite to try to eat more calories and want to keep continue to eat sweets. So even if you're using non-caloric sweeteners, <coughs> you become a food addict and you will desire more sweetened things and you're weakening your taste buds to enjoy the natural flavor in strawberries and in and delicious natural foods. Even lettuce tastes sweet when you haven't been a sugar addict that dulled your taste buds. That's why you want to reduce all your processed food, the canned food, packaged food, because there's for sure sweetener. You know, in the 70s, we took fat out of the food because we didn't want to get fat. Well, we've added sugar to everything, and there's the high fructose corn syrup, and it's all kinds of sugars. So start getting fresh food. That, that's how you get out of that. Uh, I, I don't want to forget this, because the most brilliant thing I've ever read on this subject was Michael Pollan's uh, article in the Sunday edition of the New York Times. It's, you can find this on the internet. So look it up, Pollan on high fructose corn syrup and the increase in weight in this country. It's, it, it's brilliant. He's not a scientist. He writes better than any scientist I've ever read. Have you ever read Pollan's work? No. And I mean, I'm going to tell you. After you read that article, you know why we're fat in this country and, and in England and everywhere else. What is the relation between diet and lifestyle and Alzheim Alzheimer's disease? And why is the age of Alzheimer's occurring at younger and younger ages? Well, right now it's pretty well accepted in the scientific literature that the major risk factors for heart disease are also the same major risk factors for dementia and Al for all types of dementia, but particularly Alzheimer's disease. So we're talking about if you eat a diet that increases your risk of having a heart attack, and you don't have a heart attack, you're, you're losing mental function and you're, getting, and you're promoting Alzheimer's. But all Americans are losing intelligence as they age, which is not natural. In other words, they're losing for multiple reasons. Their, their circulation is being impa impaired. And circulation, lack of blood flow to the brain decreases your intelligence. And they're exposing themselves to spikes of glucose <coughs> and insulin from the high sugar diet and the high spikes of insulin destroys brain cells and weakens the brain and predisposes you to depression and mental illness as well. And, the, and of course, the high cholesterol and the inflammation, the oxidized LDL and the exposure to toxins, all these, there's all the factors that um, dest slowly destroy your health, destroy the brain simultaneously. Even more so because the brain doesn't produce its own antioxidants like muscle tissue can. The brain requires a continual supply of phytochemicals to defend itself from your stresses of your life. And it requires rest. And, and so the, uh, we put tremendous stress on our brain and it's no wonder that people don't even get demented even earlier. And it's no wonder that we're seeing it at an earlier age and we're seeing earlier age of strokes and we're seeing earlier age of memory loss and, la and intelligence and lack of concentration, people having to retire early. And if you want to get into a good money-making business, you can open up a nursing home for people who've had strokes between the ages of 40 and 65 that don't go into the regular nursing homes because we have more and more people having strokes at younger ages too. Uh, to, to make a point on this, in my book Longevity I wrote about 20 years ago, uh, at that point the, the top man in the world doing research on brain degradation was up at Harvard. And what was stunning to me is one of the first genes, probably the first gene that was established is this is what you look like when you have Alzheimer's or dementia. Uh, he was seeing centurions, 100-year-old people, that literally didn't have dementia and had that classic gene. But what did he do? He noted that these people were social, reading every single day, that they were using their brain with crossword puzzles. There was a wide variety of things. So diet is a part of this equation, but not the whole thing. Uh, today I joked about it in my, my uh, talk with you. When people are recluse, they have more dementia. When people lose a, a wife or lose a husband, they may have been lucid, fantastic, out doing a job, lose a husband. Within a year, they have signs of memory loss, dementia, and Alzheimer's. And what's scary is that my generation, the baby boom generation, they estimate that 25% of us are going to have this. Do you have any millions of people globally we're talking about? 
And if my generation is going to have it, God forbid, what's the children going to have who are eating these horrible foods? And by the way, using computers which lower IQ. Now we're clear on that. Computer use on a regular basis lowers IQ. It doesn't increase your intelligence. Well, I just want to say one quick thing. I don't necessarily, you know, I don't necessarily think that those are major factors compared to the dietary exactly. factors, number one. But number two, think about this for a minute. If you eat the way other Americans eat, then you placing your loved ones and your family with the responsibility of caring for you in your later years when you become <coughs> demented and sick. It's not fair to other people. It's not fair to put your, to have other people have to care for you and, run and ruin their life and stress out their life because you abused your body with food. Take great care of your health because you take care of yourselves, but you're also doing the best for your family and your loved one because you can, are being self-sufficient and send caring for yourself and not become a burden on them in your later years. So one of our guests, uh, yeah. One of our guests uh, got a call from home and uh, her mom said dad was just diagnosed with Alzheimer. And she said, what can we do? What, uh, it, you know, what can I send to them? And what can I say? And uh, you know, I said, you know, I call that diabetes type three because it's actually the hippocampus that makes insulin to take care of the, the glucose uh, frequency, the energy of uh, glucose in your brain. And when that goes down, you have a big problem. And she said, it was funny because my dad has diabetes type two. And so, so what we did, we made a schedule between, of course, vitamin D, omega-3, B12. We have a product called Conscious Brain that really gets going. And even our son who's in college says, like, send me Conscious Brain. And uh, two weeks later, he was sitting doing um, crosswords. So, you know, they, they could see the difference. And so you never take no for an answer. And, you know, it has to do with the proteins that you're ingesting that actually spikes your insulin much more than all the sugars. And so remember that it's the animal-based foods that is the biggest culprit of this. And uh, not being active, not being social, and you know all of the things that we've talked about is a big, big part. But you know your brain makes insulin. You actually take care of that part in the brain by itself. And um, your pancreas takes care of the rest of the body. So it's very important that we have a balance between the sugars. You know, glucose is the energy source of all the foods, in all the foods. When we, for example, drink our green drink, 90% is carbohydrates. Whether there's carbohydrates, carbohydrates. There is pasta carbohydrates, or there is green drink carbohydrates that turns to simple sugars. So your body is getting all the glucose that it's need. And a lot of people come to our institute with blood sugar problem, diabetes, of course. Diabetes type one, type two. A lot of people are on metformin, they're on insulin, and they have to lower. One guy was just coming in three weeks ago, he came with 60 units, he went down to seven units in three weeks. He lost 30 pounds, his cholesterol dropped 120 pounds. It's a no-brainer. But of course, it's very good if you do it under uh, supervision, um, you know, like at the institute or with Dr. F uh, Joel and, you know, with people that actually knows how to uh, get you there. But there's a lot of I information in our books and everybody's books here that really can help you too. Of, of interest, I just think it's on the similar subject to what you're bringing up is that number one, the type 2 diabetics can, the vast majority, over 90% can become non-diabetic in a short period of time, which is absolutely essential. And the type 1 diabetics, who still require insulin, can reduce their insulin needs by two-thirds. And it's the excess insulin they take that causes them to get leg amputations and blindness and kidney failure and, fi and heart attacks at the age before the age of 60. And dementia. And dementia. <laughs> and depression, of course. They exactly. become depressed. So it's this excess insulin that's shortened their lifespan. So a type 1 diabetes, diabetic doesn't have to have a shortened lifespan with high morbidity and mortality. If they eat a healthy diet, they require very little insulin and they don't get the highs and lows. Furthermore. I've been lucky enough to care for people with newly diagnosed type 1 diabetics in their childhood, and I have reversal. I have numerous children who came to me early on when they were first diagnosed with type 1 diabetes, and they no longer have type 1 diabetes because they caught it, we exactly. caught it early enough. Exactly. And I'm, I'm, putting, I'm putting that out shortly in a medical research a case study list 
of all the children who have gotten rid of their type 1 diabetes oh, completely. Showing with the blood test, the islet cell antibodies and all the I that show them that they reversed it completely. And I waited for two years and years to get the make the collection to make sure I followed them to enough years to make sure they were totally gone from having type 1 so diabetes. You, you have enough that you should do a book on that because that's the one thing that nobody touches. Yeah. Well, I do have a, I did mention some of that in, the, in my book, The End of Diabetes, but not, it's mostly about type 2. Yeah. So yeah, but yeah. yeah. And, a, and a big, a big reason. Uh, I'm sorry yeah. to interrupt, but can you imagine if everyone in the, all the doctors in the country, whenever they got a, di a type 1 diabetes kid diagnosed, rapidly put them on a healthy diet yeah, and see what that. percent of them, yeah. these people could change from developing type 1. Mm -hmm. This is something nobody's even thinking about. I know, not yeah, even thinking. Uh, they don't touch it. Yeah. Yeah, fantastic. So uh, a German study about 40 years ago already uh, got onto the gluten and they found that if you have diabetes 1 or 2, you are absolutely gluten, gluten allergic. You shouldn't even come near gluten. So that was a big, big factor. Um, I just wanted to share an experience I had. I was at, in Lithuania uh, teaching at the medical school and speaking at their annual lifetime, lifestyle medicine conference. And I met a young man who was about 21 years of age. And uh, he had an experience where he was uh, diagnosed with type 1 diabetes at 15 years of age and was in intensive care. And his mom, uh, you know, completely uh, uh, freaked out that he was all of a sudden type 1 diabetic. And she, you, I'm sure you, you yeah. And, and uh, sh she started him on a, a raw food diet right away, right as he was in the hospital. And he, uh, when I met him, he was 21. He completely reversed yeah. his, his uh, diabetes. And he's still, six years later, uh, completely diabetes-free and still on the raw food diet. So this is like Dr. Furman was saying, too. Um, this is not something that is on the radar at all of mainstream medicine. No. So I think it's Even alternative medicine. Yeah, even alternative <laughs> yeah, medicine, even alternative. it's true. We, you know, the, 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 the sort of the old thinking is that once beta cells are destroyed, uh, they're, de they're dead, that's it. Whereas I think there's a possibility, and you would be able, that, that during the first few weeks, they're actually sleeping. <laughs> And, and hibernating, and, and that if, if you uh, reduce the inflammation and so on and, and get the immune system working properly, that you, you can actually bring them back. There's a, I don't know if you'd call it a, a you know, sort of honeymoon period or whatever. Yeah, and I tracked the numbers of the um, antibody on the antibodies against the pancreas beta cells and show that the antibodies over time slowly go down. You know, and I've tracked them for years and to see that they're still elevated, but they're going down and down and down, and, they're, and so the pancreas is recovering, and the activity of the autoimmune attack on the pancreas is slowly diminishing. But what the, uh, what we should do, you, you and yeah. the Institute, all of us, all yeah. four of us sitting, we should do a study. Yeah. We should put out a message worldwide mm -hmm. and basically ask for new Di diagnosed, diagnosed type, type 1 diabetes and yeah. run 30, 40 of them. I'd be more than happy to house them at the Institute and okay. do the work. Right. It's, it's, it would be really important to do this. All right, let's, work on, let's work, talk about that more. It would be great to do that. Okay. So when the subject of fats comes up, very often it's all lumped together, saying lower your fat, have this much fat. Could you tell me which are the worst fats and which are the best fats? So on the gradation of the worst fat you could possibly eat <laughs> to the best fat you could possibly eat, w how should we be thinking about fats? Fat. Well, that's a biggie. You used to kick it off. <laughs> Well, in, in my view, uh, it, the healthiest fats are fats that are packaged in whole plant foods uh, with phytochemicals and fiber and antioxidants. So we're looking at things like nuts and seeds and avocados, and so whole plant foods. So to me, when you extract and, and concentrate fats, it's kind of like extracting and concentrating sugars. You're, you're losing the fiber and a lot of the vitamins and minerals. But if, you know, we just look at sort of the worst and the best fats, the best, like I say, whole plant foods, the worst are, of course, the, the, the extracted fats that are taken and processed into uh, trans fatty acids. So they are absolutely, bar none, the worst. Explain how they do that, because most so, people don't know. Yeah, so basically you take a liquid oil, and you, you uh, add hydrogen under pressure to turn it into a solid fat. Margarine. So 
Yeah, so you've got, you've got, what happens when you're hydrogenating is you're adding hydrogen. So a fat that's saturated, all it means is it's saturated with hydrogen. It's got hydrogen every, you know, there, there are no double bonds. Hydrogen fills that molecule. Now with a trans fat, so, so as you're hydrogenating, right before you completely saturate the molecule, the, the, the two, um, you know, the double bond, the two hydrogens are sitting on the same side of the molecule. Well, one flips down to the other side to get prepared to be completely saturated. And they stop the process, and you've got this thing called a trans fatty acid. And, and so these, we know, are probably two or three times worse per gram than saturated fat. And so we're getting them out of the food supply because the evidence is so overwhelming that they're, they're, they're lethal. They're, they're extremely damaging and to human isn't health. Isn't it now, as of this year, there's not, they're not allowed it? Yeah, exactly. Okay. 2018 is it. The, the manufacturers have to get rid of them from the food supply. So they, they, this was in 2015 that they gave manufacturers three years. It's now 2018. So we won't have to worry about them as much, although there are trans fatty acids that form naturally in animal products. So about 10% of the trans fatty acids in the, in, in the diet were you know, from animal products like meat and dairy. Uh, and those, of course, people who are consuming those foods, you're not completely getting rid of trans fatty acids. And the next on the list to me would be saturated fats and especially saturated fats from animal products. All foods that have fat have some saturated fat. Uh, so it's, it's not that it's you know, a poison, it's just that we're consuming way too many. And, and then you know, next on the list would be, um, to me, well maybe even higher on the list, would be damaged fat. So when you heat uh, fat to a high temperature, you're, you're forming products of, of oxidation that are very harmful to human health. And so I think these three would be on the, my sort of the worst three list. No, I, I agree. I was going to, because you added it to yourself. You said maybe even worse than a natural saturated fat would be these vegetable oils that are heated at high temperature because they can become rancid. They have oxidative changes and they become carcinogens. And they, uh, they become mutagenic and teratogenic and they cause birth defects and DNA defects. And so what I'm saying right now is the data suggests that, for, that even in moderate use, they're particularly dangerous. For example, a study showed that one serving of commercial french fries a week, it's moderate use, just once a week, increases later life risk of breast cancer by 26%. That's one serving a week. Repeat that again for them. Yeah. 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 That one, ser you know, one french fry, commercial french fry, serving per week increased risk of breast cancer by 26%, and these things increase risk of cancer in a dose-dependent manner. So you're not, it's much more dangerous than smoking a cigarette. You don't increase your lung cancer by 26% by smoking one cigarette. Maybe even not even one pack a week would increase your risk by 26%. Heated oils are particularly dangerous. So I think with we're rating fats, we have to consider that um, one of the top factors there, especially when you're in a f restaurant that's keeping the oil under heat for many hours uh -huh. and they're cooking your food in oil Days. that's been heated over <laughs> and over again. <laughs> you know, so that's really dangerous to eat fast food. Yeah, so you buy the best oil, you buy extra virgin, the first press, organic, and then you take home and fry? It just doesn't even make sense. It turns to carcinogen, so never heat it up. Absolutely never. No oils can be heated up. No matter what you hear about coconut oil and this oil, None of the oils can be heated up. So I'm always telling you the, the sad and bad news. So I'll be the guy that says what good oils are. And so I'm writing a book now with a group of wonderful scientists out of Israel on clary sage oil. And this isn't a commercial. Uh, you know, here in America, out west, you know, we take sage and we put it in big piles and we burn it because we say, oh, that damn stuff's messing everything up. They studied it in Israel, God bless their soul. And they found out that there's an omega-3 that's the most stable form, less oxidative form of omega-3 than any land-based oil they found so far. So we've been utilizing this for about three and a half years. And one of our physicians, Dr. Willicks, uh, it's funny, I, he's just become one of our two physicians, has been doing the same kind of work with his patients. Now he was a cardiovascular surgeon, so he sees it through a different window, and it's nice to compare. I'm trying to get him to co-author this book with me. Uh, the other thing is that we've been using blue-green algae as a big part, as I s pointed out today. The first life form, second life form, third life form is the core of the Hippocrates diet. And blue-green algae has the only essential fat that's identical to the fat your brain's made of. Everything else, including clary sage oil, has to, in a mi minuscule way, go through the blood-brain barrier and hope to manufacture that fat. 
Then, you know, the, the usual suspects are not bad. The usual suspects, chia, sprouted chia seeds. At night when I'm home and Anna Marie and I are putting seeds in our salad, we put five seeds. Sprouted chia, sprouted sesame, sprouted flax, sprouted hemp, and uh, pumpkin seeds. And why sprout it? Because you liberate it. It's very, very difficult, even for very healthy people, to digest these things. These seeds have encapsulated shells in them. When you open them up and liberate them, they become plants. And as I pointed out through the anthropology you saw today, that our original diet was leafy greens and fruits. It wasn't even nuts and seeds. You know? And we eat nuts and seeds, which are much, much better than meats and dairies and everything else. But the fact of the matter is, now we know for sure. It's not a question anymore. If you look at the indentation on the teeth of what people ate over hundreds of thousands and uh, ex millions of years, they found out that our ancestors as well as Homo sapiens have been eating fruits and leaves. And when there were droughts, yes, they ate nuts and seeds, etc. But if you sprout them, you are eating leaves at that point. They become germinated. That's where the phytochemical enhances 30, 40, 50, 60 times. That's the medicine. I mean, at the punchline, no matter what any of us say, the most impressive thing we can tell you, why people heal disease on the program is not because of what we take away, it's because of what's in there called the phytochemical that kills and prevents disease. Now, within nuts and seeds are sterols and stanols that bind fat tightly like a magnet. So when you get your fat from nuts and seeds, all the fat is not biologically accessible to the body because a, a percentage of that fat is sucked out into the toilet bowl, increasing stool fat. <laughs> more fat in the toilet bowl means more less fat on you. Now, the particular magnetic effect of the sterols and stanols and nuts and seeds that attract fat have an affinity for saturated fat and LDL cholesterol more strongly than regular mono and polyunsaturates. In other words, if we analyze the fat that's in the toilet bowl, it's the oxidized LDL that was in your bloodstream that came out in the toilet bowl as a result of eating the nuts and seeds. Nuts and seeds lower LDL cholesterol, but they particularly lower oxidized LDL, the most dangerous type of LDL, because they suck it out because fat trans goes in both directions. It goes from the digestive tract into the bloodstream, and it goes from the bloodstream into the digestive tract. And the magnet to suck out those bad fats are these beneficial nuts and seeds. And oxidized LDL causes heart disease and cancer. That's correct. Yeah. So regarding um, this uh, Dr. Gunter, who's making a claim that there's lectins in a vegan diet that are not good, are you familiar <laughs> with this claim and do you want to comment on it? Yeah, that's not his name. It's, um, Sorry. Gundy, I think. Okay. Yeah, we're, we're all familiar with it. He's not Ganji, it. he's Gunji. Yeah. <laughs> I I forgot, now I forgot. Now I'm all confused. I forgot Whatever his name, his name is, Mr. Lechner. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so you have to understand mm -hmm. that I, I, I think a lot of people become enthusiastic about what they're currently experiencing in their own life and start to expound on it outside of their knowledge zone and comfort zone. And that's what happened with this gentleman. If you read on in his book, he'll also tell you that free-range chicken would be a great thing to eat, not a cucumber. Uh, not, not, for instance, a red pepper. I've been giving red peppers to people, organic red peppers, for decades. Why? Because they're loaded with vitamin C. I've never seen anyone get sick on our diet, but contrary, the exact opposite. But I have seen people get sick on free-range chickens and chickens. So I think what, what we have to do, I don't know what you have to do, what I always choose to do is look at the wide story, not just somebody's enthusiastic opinion. I'm sure a lot of people do this for the right reason and believe in what they're writing. But the fact is that there's no science that would actually prove what he's saying is true. We can show you overwhelming science and data. As a matter of fact, you'd have to live another five lives just to see the science on plant-based nutrition and how it prevents aging and disease. I mean, it's that simple. We go to bed reading science as we will tonight, get up reading science, and we touch a fraction of a fraction of 1% probably of what's coming up. Some people are sloppy in their science, yeah. and some people are just frankly dishonest. Yeah, you're right. And I don't know, call a spade a spade. If you look at the book, and you ma he makes this claim, and he has a reference and a scientific reference that supports that claim, yeah. and you say, oh, must be some scientific reference. This claim doesn't really sound like it's really right, but if there's a scientific reference, you pull out the scientific reference, you read the article, it didn't support the claim. And that just happened one place in the book, it happens over and over again on almost every page of the book. 
he's, he's dishonest, he's making up stories, and he's concocting a program so that he's determined, determined how to get rich on mm -hmm. by selling something that's going to solve the problem that he created to begin with and faked. Well, I've heard so he, it's sold, it's he sold 68 million copies on the internet. Is that wow. true? I have no idea. This is one of the most... Po but he's selling these yeah. supplements that'll fix the problem with the lectins and the food that he invented is yeah. the problem. That's always suspect. You know, but, <laughs> but, but if you read the book with scrutiny, yeah. you will recognize that, there, that he's distorted the data from the scientific literature and false to falsely support the claims he made in the book that are just plain wrong. And, and I'd like to add one more thing. You can always do what I like to call the acid test. And the acid test to me for this book, or the claims in this book, would be what do the healthiest, longest lived people on the planet do? And the only thing that they all do in terms of food choices is every single blue zone consumes legumes. Legumes are the most concentrated source of lectins. If lectins were poison, they probably wouldn't be the healthiest, longest <laughs> lived people in the world. I never thought of that. You That's know, right. it's just, it's a, the common sense. And, and the other thing is almost all the studies showing negative health consequences of lectins are on animals eating raw legumes. So raw legumes, and, and, and also we need to understand there are, there are lectins that are quite dangerous, and there are lectins that are now being used to, to make uh, cancer, as a cancer therapy exactly. that are uh, actually powerful. Yeah. But 100% of his patients recovered from every disease in the world. Oh. Because they <laughs> they I didn't read that I mean, part. Is that what he said? Oh, yeah. They <laughs> all cleared all their diseases up. I mean, well, the claims are I just... I wish I had that track record. <laughs> 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 Did you read that in the book? You know, if, <laughs> well, like and uh, if you look at, if you look at uh, these, uh, you know, the studies on humans, the only studies on humans showing negative consequences of, say, red kidney beans or whatever it is, is when people were served the kidney beans that weren't cooked properly. They were cooked for 15 minutes. They were still hard. And you get, you get a, a horrible food poisoning-like reaction when you eat large legumes that aren't cooked properly. Small legumes like lentils and mung beans you can sprout and safely consume, and the lectins in those products are less toxic than the lectins in the large legumes. So, I mean, humans don't eat raw, large legumes. We cook them first if we're eating them. So it's, it, they've blown the whole lectin thing far out of proportion, and they're using research that is research that's not pertinent to what they're saying to back their claims. Here, it's the part of the story that's interesting, excuse me, part of the story that's in, I just want to throw this in then uh, Joel will take. Lectins are actually part of this incredible system that nature created to protect the seed. That literally seeds were here on plants millions, hundreds and hundreds of millions of years before we showed up. And literally, every seed has a natural pesticide on it. This isn't man-made pesticide, natural pesticide. So that, that species of plants would never perish. So the bugs would never eat the last one because they'd get sick. And the animals would never eat the last one because they'd get sick. And it's actually an integral part, the lectin, of this. And that's why we're able to now use it as a, a neurotoxin reversal with cancers and other things. Now, that's not claiming there's not some people that don't react negatively to certain foods, including beans and lectins. Anything. And there's, and whatever we're saying, or we're generalizing, there are still individuals that require dietary modification to meet their individual needs that they're particularly sensitive to certain foods or food groups. So it doesn't mean we're, we're saying beans are the perfect food for everybody. There's always exceptions to every rule. You better not say that in Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I'd like to start trading off questions, so I'm going to ask a question, and then one person in the audience will ask a question, then back to me, and then back to you. So if you have a good question, and you want to ask a very direct question, why don't you raise your hands, we'll pass you a microphone, and then after my question, we'll go to you, then back to me, and we'll trade back and forth. Um, okay? So I'll ask my question, you can hand the person a microphone, and we could, I'll let the audience trade off questions. Keep um, your so hands up until the microphones <coughs> come here. So my question is, um, regarding salt, salt on bad dog, with bad food and with good foods. A lot of times I feel like I think I'm eating healthy, but I notice my guacamole from Whole Foods has salt. My salsa has salt. My dehydrated flax crackers have salt. My chickpea croquettes that are dehydrated have salt. 
and I, my, my sauerkraut has salt. And I tell myself that it's okay because I'm eating a lot of healthy things and somehow I've justified that salt's okay. So one salt on healthier diets and two salt in fast food, um, how should we, th how, how should, you know, you're saying be careful with animal products, um, how should we think about salt, both on the healthy diet and on the unhealthy diet? I, I challenge most of the health people on this one, frankly, because all, all of these salts, even with fancy names, Celtic salt, crystal salt, are sodium chloride. Now we can't change that. Sodium chloride is sodium chloride. I don't care if you get it from the ocean or below the ground in Arkansas where there's salt mines, or if you get it from somebody oming in Russia in, in a cave on this. It's sodium chloride is not a healthy salt. Although sodium, without it, we die. It's actually what is antiseptic for your lymphatic fluid. So we need it, but you should get it through food, and that would be my first choice. Now we use salt when people have, they're getting weak and their electrolytes go down, and often when we're IVing whole food supplements into them. So we actually use crystal salt. The same thing I'm telling you is bad for you. Um. I, I agree with what you just said, the fact that um, all these sodiums, whether where you get them from, still expose you to an excess amount of sodium. But let me address one aspect to your question. Because let's say you're eating healthier. Does that make the salt less damaging? Because salt, excessive amounts of sodium, no matter what it's, where its source is coming from, excessive amount of any type of salt, can cause microvascular hemorrhaging. An increased risk of autoimmune conditions, it's pro-inflammatory. What I'm saying right now is it damages the endothelial of your blood, of your lining of your blood vessels, weaken the structural foundation of your blood vessels, and predisposing them to having a hemorrhage and a, and a, and a hemorrhagic stroke, um, and not dependent on your blood pressure. I'm saying salt damages people by raising blood pressure, and blood pressure damages brain cells, increases the risk of heart attacks and strokes. But I'm also saying salt directly damages the endothelium outside of its effect on raising blood pressure. Now. Why is it that people with lower cholesterol have higher rates of hemorrhagic stroke? Why is it that people in Asian countries have higher risks of hemorrhagic stroke and lower rates of ischemic or embolic stroke, which is caused by a clot or the same thing that cause a heart attack? And the answer is because when you eat the cheese and the burgers and the meats that increase your risk of atherosclerosis and increase your risk of having a heart attack or an embolic stroke, it thickens the blood vessel wall with atherosclerosis, protecting the fragile blood vessels in the brain from the, effect of, from the effects of having a hemorrhagic stroke. What I'm saying right now is a person on a healthy diet or a vegan type diet lowers their risk of heart attacks and ischemic or embolic strokes, but if they're still eating a significant amount of salt, they can be at a significant increased risk of hemorrhagic stroke over the person who eats meat. So now what we've done in the Asian populations who are high salt consumers, is we've lowered the rate of heart attack and increased the risk of stroke to make up for the people that are not dying of heart attacks. So we, their overall lifespan is just as bad as there is in America. And what we're doing among certain vegan populations is reducing the risk of embolic stroke and increasing the risk of hemorrhagic stroke because they're still eating a lot of salt in your diet. I propose that salt is more dangerous to a vegan than it is to a meat eater because, you're, you're actually, because your blood vessels are not gonna be coated with with the plaque and thickening yeah. no that can protect them from hemorrhage. No protecting Right, agents, there's no protection. Right. So why not protect against all these diseases? And when you're on a low salt diet chronically or you know, taking less than 1,000 a day or something from you know, what, what natural foods give us, natural food gives us about 500 to 700 a day, you have a couple of hundred extra, you're still under 1,000. When you're on that low salt diet, your body learns to hold on to sodium. It doesn't excrete it in the urine, it doesn't excrete it in the sweat. And now when you're running marathons or playing tennis in the heat, or so you're not pushing out salt and your body is more stable. You don't have your salt doesn't fluctuate up and down. And then when you don't eat salt, your taste gets stronger for salt. Now, lettuce tastes better and, and vegetables have more flavor. Celery, and you, yeah. Right, and so you can taste the natural flavors of food. People are used to eating a lot of salt. Nothing has any taste anymore. And they have to salt things to get flavor. And I'm saying it, doesn't inc it didn't increase your pleasure. All that salt eating has lessened your ability to enjoy the subtle flavors in natural foods that are so much stronger when your taste is not deadened by sodium, by so much sodium. Remember, before we had refrigeration, which wasn't long ago, they used to preserve meats with salt. So this is part of why we got into this process. A, a lot of our guests come in with low sodium and low chloride. Like in a blood test, uh, you should be like 135 and up with sodium. A lot of people come in like 129. And then you think, you need salt. No. <laughs> and so our experience is these people have used a lot of salt in their diet before they came. 
and, and they're not able to detoxify. They're not eliminating like they should. And then we don't give them salt, but they get a lot of sodium in the juices, or celery, all the vegetables and seaweeds and things like that. By the time we have in the next blood test, they have perfect sodium. Can I help you with that just for a second? Yeah. I think I can help you. Is that, because I've seen this and tested over years with people in blood tests, mm -hmm. is that when you're consuming a high amount of salt, let's say 3,000 to 4,000 a day, mm -hmm. your body has to keep homeostasis by keeping the sodium in the bloodstream content consistent. Yeah. So your urine gets trained and learns how to excrete a huge amount of sodium. Yes. And your sweat is excreting sodium and your respirations are excreting sodium as well. Mm -hmm. so your body is pushing out sodium all the time. When this person goes from a high sodium diet immediately to a very low sodium diet, their kidney and their urine and their, um, and their sweat and their breath is still secreting high amounts of sodium and they'll become hyponatremic, their sodium will become too low. It takes weeks for the body to learn how to hold on to sodium. On a and the same thing is true the opposite with me. I don't need hardly any sodium. If I go to have some Chinese vet restaurant or eat an olive or something with sodium, my body's not used to excreting the sodium. I'm holding on to my sodium. Mm -hmm. Now that's what really good health is. You hold on to the, because when you're holding on to sodium, you're maintaining your electrolytes in your body and with the sodium, you're, not, you're saving the mineral content of your body. You're not putting, using it and requiring so much. But in any case, the point I'm making is there's a temporarily lowering of the sodium when sweet people switch from a high sodium diet to a very low sodium diet and sometimes you have to take it down more gradually or you have to you know, give it to tell them they're going to be okay and reassure them they can be a little bit feeling a little weak for a, for a week or so but it does resolve itself with time and your body accommodates and gets used to the amount of sodium you consistently consume. I think what we need to do is when people get married put sodium in both of them so they <laughs> stick together. <laughs> Okay, can I take one of the microphones to give to the audience? Does Surely. You guys have okay, so um, please um, just ask one question, no follow-up, um, and I'd prefer not to be a health consultation, just ask a direct question um, of the speakers. Thank you. Thank you. Please, your thoughts about vaccinations across the age spectrum, please. Well, we have four children, seven grandchildren. We chose not to vaccinate any of our children. Our children chose not to vaccinate. Uh, the most important book I've read on the subject out of dozens and dozens of books was uh, authored by Robert F. Kennedy, Jr., who's a, an environmental attorney, but it was really uh, put together by a Harvard and a Tufts University physician. It's called Ethel Mercury. And I think anyone should read it. It was a very quick read. I thought it would take three weeks to read it. I read it in a few hours. So it, it's very concise. Very, and what I love about it, they're not saying I'm anti-vaccines. What they're saying is, by the way, why don't we make vaccines that don't have ethyl mercury, that don't have aluminum in it? And, you know, because vaccines have, it's a double-edged sword. There's no question it saved millions and millions of people's, maybe billions of people's lives. And it, there's no question it's implicated with some disorders today. Well, look, I mean, it's well known among scientists and physicians and researchers that every medical intervention has risks associated with it. You don't get something for nothing. There's risks. And the problem is, in the, in one of the major problems in the medical profession is that the drug company studies don't look at long-term risks. They only consider immediate or short-term risks. So there's so much about vac so much potential risk in vaccine that nobody is looking at. The, com the combining of 21 vaccines in the first six months of life and whether that increases autoimmune disease or cancer risk 20 years later or in a teenage year. So in other words, there's so much about vaccines that we don't know. We really can't accurately ascertain the risks because in this country, nobody's putting money to look at that and to see what w the real benefit versus risk ratio. But nowhere, not only this no. country, nowhere no. in the world. Are they now, if you want to look at maybe get an outside opinion, you can't even look at studies done by universities or people in this country. If you want to look at to get a more impartial view of the, like, let's say if the uh, flu vaccine is really effective, you got to go outside this country to see people like in the Cochrane analysis, looking at what we're doing in a more non-biased sense and we get a more impartial view to learn how relatively ineffective they are compared to the marketing we get over the airways all the day with them and the idea that people are dying with left and right and we got to take Tamiflu and we got to take the, you know, whatever the point I'm making is that it's very hard for even us to know the facts because we don't have the data to, to be able to answer the questions accurately because the studies aren't even done. 
So we, you know, so it's a, it's, it's unfortunate. It is unfortunate. Uh, are there any countries in the world that have taken on these plant-based uh, nutrition as a serious uh, health policy? As I'm referring especially even to uh, Brenda Davis has done a work in uh, Marshall Island, whether some of the smaller Pacific nations or any countries indeed that's taken on this? Well, yeah, I mean, I've been working, I'm, I'm sorry, but I sometimes get it interrupted with like emergencies with people, but um, I'm not 100% sure what you're saying, but yes, I've worked with the government of Jamaica, for example, and I've been looked, worked on their food plate and saw their, and they adopted some of their food, uh, not their food plate, from part of my work, and they're trying to advocate people eat what they grow and not take in the fast foods and the franken foods coming from other countries. So there are countries in small countries of the world who recognize that the health care, reducing health care costs and protecting the health of their population from the damaging effect in the American influence. And actually, we're finding out that we're working with, you know, with, with people that know what's happening around the world. We're actually um, we're having politicians and government and health professionals working together that are doing much more advocacy for their population to live a healthy life than goes on in this country, definitely. I mean, if you look at a country like Germany now, in Germany, over half the population, I think 57% the last I read, consciously choose to eat four vegan meals a week. Now that's a major, in a place like Germany, where when I used to go to health restaurants there 40 years ago, all I got is potatoes. <laughs> it's, a, it's a wild shift in the right direction. And uh, I, I worked with the Indian government. But again, what happens is the administrations change. And so I worked with the Egyptian under Sadat. I worked with his government. And the Irish government, when somebody came and reversed disease, who was part of it. But it's unfortunately so short-lived. Until we had a policy in place in one of these governments, nobody's done long-term serious things. And I'm probably the same with Jamaica. You go there and somebody's enthusiastic about it, somebody's voted in, and before you know it, that's out the window. But the country that does it, as Denmark has decided to be the first country that gets off the grid, which it will do in the next 30 years, is going to be the country that will lead the world in health care. Um, and I'll, I'll just add a little bit about the Marshall Islands experience. And first, in answer to your question, I, I don't know of any country right now that is really promoting a plant-based diet for their entire population. I do know that um, in Israel, I believe they have the highest percentage of... Five and a half percent. Of, yeah. Um, it, it, so they're, they're increasing their, their interest uh, quite dramatically there. Uh, but in the Marshall Islands, the Marshall Islands are islands um, that are in the, in the Pacific between um, uh, Hawaii and Australia, about 2,300 miles southwest of Hawaii. And so they're very, very remote. And, you know, 100 years ago, there, there was no, uh, absolutely zero diabetes. Uh, and and uh, they lived off the land, of course, as... as uh, most Pacific Islanders did at, at one time. And so for many generations, all they ate was the plants that they could collect from the island and the fish that they could catch with their spears or whatever from, from the sea, uh, from the ocean. And, and so what happened was um, uh, as their, uh, the main islands became overpopulated, so for example, the main island, Majuro, has 30,000 people on it, it's 3.7 square miles in area, um, and it might sustain 500 or 1,000 people at most if they were living off the land, but now there are so many people there, they have to import foods. And because there, there's th almost no economy, uh, there, there are very few jobs, um, people don't have a lot of money, so as you can imagine, what they're importing is the cheapest food that they can bring in. So it's ramen noodles, uh, cheap white rice, and spam. Uh, they drink high fructose corn syrup. The number one drink is, is called luau, and the number one ingredient is high fructose corn syrup. Mm. And, and, and if that isn't d you know, hard enough to hear, the children, their favorite snack, is dry ramen noodles. So, you know, ramen noodles are these white flour noodles deep fried with about 1,800 milligrams of sodium per, per package. 
and they take these ramen noodles and to flavor them up, they eat them raw, but they sprinkle Kool-Aid powder on top uh, huh. before Sounds eating like them. Sounds like my old diet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then I, I remember standing with a Marshallese person looking at this little, little person eating these ramen noodles and bef after they sprinkled the Kool-Aid powder on, they sprinkled on this white powder. <laughs> I'm thinking, what in the heck are they putting? Okay. Sugar? Salt? And I said, w what are they putting on the ramen noodles? And, the, and oh, that's a Sinamoto. Well, a Sinamoto, of course, is pure MSG. So, so, you know, the people in the Marshall I Islands really couldn't have adopted a diet that would be more efficient at inducing diabetes than the diet they've adopted, and now they have one of the highest rates of diabetes on the planet. And so when, when I, I mean, honestly, I would guess, you know, well, over 50% of the adults have type 2 diabetes. The, you know, uh, while it's, uh, I shouldn't say that over 50% of the adults over 35 have type 2 diabetes. The children are lean as can be. They're, there's very little obesity among the children because they're so active. But as soon as they hit their adult years, they become overweight and probably close to 75, 80% are overweight. And, uh, and so what we did when we went in is introduced a plant-based diet and they can consume some fish if they can, because it's, you know, they're on a little island and that's their, their cultural food is coconut and fish, right? So, but we tell them if they do consume fish, it needs to be boiled or cooked in some way where they're not frying it. And, and so otherwise at the clinic where we're treating them, it's 100% plant-based. And so what we saw is, is a dramatic shift in, in blood sugars and, in di and we had several people reverse their diabetes completely, of course. And so the government started to get quite interested. And so I've been going back, I started going in 2006 and this year I went back just a couple of months ago and what I was invited to do was go there for three weeks and create a curriculum for grades kindergarten to six and train every teacher in the public schools to teach nutrition to the children. And so it's, it's, you know, it's encouraging, thank you very much, it's encouraging to see the interest and in, as a matter of fact, they have just created a policy where it will be illegal to sell sweet drinks and fried snack foods within a certain parameter of any school and the teachers who bring this stuff to sell to the students are no longer allowed to do that. So we're really starting to see change and, and so I, I really believe that the, you know, we're, I don't know if we're quite at the tipping point but we're sure getting close. And I think people are starting to catch on. Yeah. So that's very we, we encouraging. Last year we question. hit the top of the peak, we're heading. Now, yeah. we're heading. Yeah, lock them back. We should start a political party. <laughs> <laughs> um, my question is, um, does veganism or raw food diets help reverse uh, osteoporosis? Uh, and are there certain foods that are sh better had or not had regarding that? Vegan diets help osteoporosis in one specific way. You take away the animal food that has three basic bone and cell eroding acids in it. But really what reverses osteoporosis is weightlifting. If you're not willing to weightlift, I don't care what you eat, you're not going to get well. So I've worked with thousands of people who've reversed osteoporosis and didn't worse do it, and it was about weightlifting at the end of the day. Not calcium. Right, I have, in my wellness center, we have a program for, for women who have osteoporosis. And we have, even have equipment in the office. We have um, equipment for heavy weightlifting that enables even for people who are frail to be able to support heavy weight on their body safely. And we have, a, um, and we have some vibration training machines, so we absolutely agree 100%. And the idea, and the, and the point that I'm making, additional point I'm making, is that your bones and muscles grow simultaneously. Your muscles, your bones don't get weak unless your muscles are also weak. And when you strengthen your muscles, you simultaneous, simultaneously strengthen your bones. And that osteoporosis and osteopenia is grossly overdiagnosed anyway. And a lot of fear is created that's needless. And you don't, you know, but basically, obviously, people get weaker as they age, and they should be more, they should, if they eat healthy and they age slower, 
which we talked about, aging slower, maintaining youthful vigor and being healthier, your muscles and bones stay stronger and you can stay more active as you get older and it all works synergistically. And, and just to recognize that, you know, a lot of people think osteoporosis is a dairy deficiency disease. <laughs> they, you know, it, 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 it's caused because you're not, <laughs> you're not consuming enough milk. But what you need to, to understand is that osteoporosis is a multifactorial disease. And I couldn't agree more with exercise. The only people I've seen actually increase bone density as they get older are people that have increased physical activity. But what you do need to know is if you're becoming vegan and you're eliminating sort of our traditional calcium sources and traditional vitamin D sources, you need to be consuming a diet that provides the nutrients that do help to build strong bones. So you need enough calcium. In, in the Epic Oxford study, they found that vegans that consumed under 525 milligrams of calcium a day had over 30% more uh, an increased risk of, of fracture. In the Adventist Health study too, the Adventists are consuming over 900, the Adventist vegans are consuming over 900 milligrams of calcium a day. So their bone density, there, there's not a lot of, of difference between them and the meat eaters. Now the other thing you need to know is that we, years ago people used to say uh, more protein means that you're going to urinate more calcium out of your urine and increase your risk of, of fractures. Well, what we've learned since is that, yes, it's true that, that protein does increase urinary calcium excretion, but it also helps with calcium absorption. It helps you build stronger bones, and it's part of the bone matrix. So people eating plant-based diets need to get enough protein to keep their bones strong. And so this, the thinking of you know, really limiting protein intake, as a, definitely as a meat eater, but as a plant-based eater, you actually need to make sure you get enough protein. So there was a, a study, again, the Adventist Health Study, showing that women who consumed the most legumes had, I think it was 63% reduced risk of fractures. So it's, it's important to make sure your diet is well balanced. You've got a source of vitamin D. You've got your calcium, you've got your magnesium, potassium, all of these nutrients that contribute to building uh, strong bones. And then, of course, weight-bearing exercise. And the other thing I'd like to mention is my mom um, was always, she grew up on a farm. She was always a fairly big uh, dairy consumer, and, but always physically active. When she was 50 years old, she developed osteoporosis, and she's been uh, very good about her exercise, and so, so she's been maintaining her bone density reasonably well. But when I hit, um, it was just around, I think, 49 years of age or so, about 10 years ago, um, I was, um, my doctor said, you know, you've been vegan for over 20 years. Your, your mom ha has osteoporosis. You are a slim Caucasian female. You're at high risk. You don't, you know, you're not, you're, you know, your diet may be low. In so anyway, he said, let's do bone density. And my bone density came back when I went to his office to get my results. He opened my chart and his jaw dropped. <laughs> um, he said, your bone density in your uh, femur is two and a half standard deviations above norm for your age. They couldn't plot it on the chart. There was an arrow at the top of the chart. And, and, and I think one other spot, spine or whatever, was two standard deviations above norm for my age. And he said, I don't know what you're doing, but whatever you're doing, your bones are made of steel. Just <laughs> keep doing it. And, and what I'm doing is exercise from the time I was a teenager has always been a very significant part of my life. So I, I, you know, to me, it's like eating, sleeping, going to the bathroom. You need to keep moving and keep physically active every day of your life at, that you're able to do that. And so, I mean, even when I, the day I delivered, my, my, my children are 33 and 30 years of age, but the day I delivered my children, the day I delivered my son, I swam a mile before I delivered him. So... <laughs> he wanted to come out after that. You know, you know what, the lifeguards... <laughs> the, the lifeguards were so scared that baby was <laughs> going to pop out in the water. But anyway, and I think that, that what I'm trying to say is just because you're vegan doesn't mean you're at higher risk for osteoporosis. There are so many factors that come together to, to help you build strong bones. 
and that br and that's and I'm really this is a great conversation and I'm agreeing and it brings to the point to make the good point that not all vegan diets are created equal. You bet. And there are some diets that are proposed these super low fat high starch carbohydrate diets like macrobiotic type diets or potato based diets that people aren't getting adequate calcium. They're not taking in enough green vegetables, not getting adequate protein with the beans and the hemp seeds and, the, and, the, and, the, and all the other things we eat, the broccoli and the, that, are, that are giving us adequate protein. And as we age, our ability to assimilate calcium and protein go down. Yeah. Whereas that's where I think that we're on the same page here, that we're eating diet that's high in vegetables, we're using beans, we're using seeds, we're using things that supply us with what we need, and we're getting a variety of nutrients, a good range of nutrients humans need, and we're also getting the necessary minerals and the necessary proteins we need, especially as we age. Yeah. On this type, on this type of diet, which I have coiled, call a nutritarian diet, which is essentially what we're, all, what we're advocating here. I'm just calling it something different, but it's a similar, you know. So don't hang your hat on, on medications like Fosimax. Remember when that first came out? All the women, all the older women, especially at our gym, they said, heck with this, I have to stand for half an hour and I have so much pain, I can't take it. So they'd rather go to the gym and lift weights and, and keep themselves strong that way. And I did deliver in water. I had water birth. <laughs> yeah, so now the, the, the thing is, of course, we, we keep ourselves with a high protein, this is the highest protein diet that you can find, the highest nutritious diet. So, but you can add protein. No way, no way, okay? Whey uh, um, spikes your insulin even more than meat. It, it's you know what whey is, right? Yeah, whey protein. Oh. So you choose some good uh, sprouted uh, uh, proteins, um, uh, fermented rice protein and so on, and you can uh, substitute that you can have that with your exercise if you want to uh, pump up a little more. The Hippocrates, the Hippocrates diet is really an incredibly high protein diet. Just the sprouts alone. They've been broken down from complex proteins to amino acids that are usable by the body. When I was a macrobiotic, and I helped Michio Kushi write the Macrobiotic Way book, uh, around the same time, I was really, I think that's probably why I learned as much as I did. Harvard did a study on the macrobiotics. They went and wanted advocacy from Harvard, and they found out that they had a much higher incidence of osteoporosis, tooth decay, etc., because of what Joel just said, that these incredibly high carbohydrate diets with very low protein and very low calcium, the only greens they had, they cooked to death in that diet. And remember, they discovered originally calcium where? Green leafy vegetables. So, yeah. um, Dr. Furman, during your lecture today, you used the term G-bombs, um, and to mention greens, beans, onions, mushrooms. I thought it was a curse word. <laughs> um, the one question, I guess, is in terms of whole grains, and let's break them into two groups. Let's say quinoa, millet, amaranth, buckwheat, wild rice, and teff all grains that I believe don't have gluten, and then another category, let's call glutinous grains that like wheat, barley, and oats. Um, why in your G-bombs are you not mentioning those non-glutinous whole grains? Wouldn't they also, like beans, be part of a healthy diet? Um, and then what about grains such as wheat, barley, and oats? Right, you, you're misinterpreting my point of the G-bombs, which I'm glad you're asking the question so I have a chance to clarify. I'm not saying your diet should only consist of G-bombs. I'm using the acronym G-bombs so you remember the foods that have the most association with prevention of cancer in the scientific literature. And I want you to remember to eat them regularly. That's not saying you don't eat other foods that are, that are not G-bombs. You could eat all those grains, especially the ones you mentioned in the first group, and grains are best eaten, because seeds are in G-bombs, nuts aren't in G-bombs, but I advocate nuts, especially walnuts and pistachio nuts. And there are a lot of foods that I eat all the time that are not in G-bombs. Fruits in, is not in G-bombs. Just because it's not in G-bombs doesn't mean I don't advocate eating it. It's just I want people to particularly focus on making sure they get even a little bit of mushrooms and a little bit of scallion and a little bit of onion and a little bit of you know, cream cruciferous vegetable and a little bit of flaxseed or cheese. And I want to make sure they include these things in their diet. That's what the purpose of that is, okay? But when you eat your grains, I <coughs> want your grains to be in the intact form, not ground into a flour. Because even when you take a healthy grain and you grind it into a flour or a pastry flour, it's going to increase its glycemic load. So sprouted, intact is, is good, and sprouted is probably even better. But the, so the point is, is that 
It's not that I'm against grains, but I want them to be not the major source of calories in the diet, so you can be, have room in your diet to include all these foods you're supposed to be eating. So I don't want a grain-based diet. I want a vegetable-based diet. Number two, the grains that you do eat, you want them to choose the healthiest choices possible. Could you, somebody can continue I'm on that. I'm happy to, to add, and I've created this thing, uh, for those of you that were at my lecture today, called the whole grain hierarchy. And so we know <laughs> refined grains, you want to get out. Um, whole grains, you have to realize that there is various levels of processing of whole grains. And so the whole grains that are the most healthful is as they're picked off the plant, nothing added, nothing taken away, and they're eaten that way. And the very best would be sprouting them because when you sprout them, you reduce anti-nutrients, you, you release stored forms of nutrients, you massively increase the phytochemical protective army of, of these go, protective chemicals. Away. Yeah, exactly. And so you're doing a lot, a, lot, a lot of wonderful things. But when you eat those grains intact, you can eat um, you know, a, a chemut berry salad or a, a quinoa you know, salad or something like that. Whereas when you turn them into flour, you don't eat a bowl of flour. You add, you've, you're going to be adding fat and sugar and salt and all of these things to make that flour into whatever baked product or exactly all of those things and so and so ideally you want to be sticking predominantly to intact grains and and most people most of the grains they eat are wheat and so you want to mix up your grains and just like every food category you get different benefits from different types of grains and some people maybe 10% of the population don't, don't do well with gluten-containing grains. And so the, you know, the first category of grains w works better for those people. I personally do eat some gluten-containing grains. I love kamut. I sprout it. I, I, I love having um, y using barley, for example, in our Marshall Islands population because it has the lowest glycemic index by far of any grain. And so it well, works well for people with diabetes if it's, if, if it's intact. Um, so, so those are the kinds of issues that I would c consider. And certainly whole grains are not as nutrient dense as beans and greens and these other foods. So the way that I explain it to people is you use grains, they're not necessary in the human diet. There's no nutrient from grains that you couldn't get from elsewhere, but they are a reasonable food to vary according to your energy needs. So if you're a senior woman who doesn't need a lot of calories, you eat your beans and greens and vegetables and fruits and nuts and seeds and whatever extra calories you need, you could throw in a few grains. For, for a triathlete who's burning 5,000 calories a day, they can afford more grains. So I, I, that's sort of the way that I would suggest doing, doing it is, is f based on your energy needs. Yeah. Um, I'm going to ask another question, then we'll ask yours. You, you can give it to her, please. Just give it to her. Um, in terms of colonoscopies, mammographies, PSA tests, which test, which common medical test do you recommend and which do you think, I assuming someone's eating the diet and lifestyle you're recommending, which of these medical tests would you recommend that they do and which would you recommend, which medical tests would you recommend we do and which would you recommend we don't, um, starting with colonoscopies, mammographies, PSA tests? Well, you know, th that's a hard question because you have to clarify what you mean. If people have history, you obviously can't be cavalier and say to them that you don't do the test. So some of these tests, we all know they have side effects. But the truth of the matter is they're necessary evils at point. So if somebody has a history of colon cancer, they come to us and somehow they reverse it. What do we say? Just believe you reversed it. So they're going to have to have the test at some point. And I would say they should have a test, not consistently, but at least every six months for the first two years and maybe every three quarter to a year after that for the first five years. And then maybe after that, every two years. If you look at mammograms, I mean, there's no question that mammograms, because you listen to the debate within mainstream medicine, is 15% false readings. We see it all of the time. People come to us who don't have cancer, they're being told, and vice versa. They have full blast cancer, you can see it, and they're being told they don't have cancer. Uh, thermography is great, but who, how many people can really interpret thermography well? That's a mistake I've seen made quite a bit. So I trust some of the people very, very much, but there are not many of those people I know. It doesn't mean they're not there. I don't know. 
If you look at virtual colonoscopies, I'd much prefer a person does that than a normal colonoscopy. But again, that involves a CAT scan. Yeah, that involves a CAT scan. But so, I mean, I, I think, look, at where modern medicine shines, let's be really clear about that, is diagnostically. And in emergency medicine, God bless them. I think the only real doctors, anyone of that calls ourselves doctors or jokers compared to ER doctors, they sit there and save lives every day and... You know, they're wonderful doctors. But the truth of the matter is, I think it's time that we get together. We try to improve that. There are new types of mammograms that give very little to no radiation, I've been told. It's just employing them, getting them in. There's new scanning that they're doing with digital scanning that won't have these residual effects. And we shouldn't be fighting anymore. We should basically be at a round table and saying, what are you really good at? Now let's let your ego and the money and all of the other concerns be at the door. Let's let your influence from the corporations and business. What are you really good at? We're all good at lifestyle. We should be the first approach always. But then do you throw out the emergency room doctor? No, because <laughs> you may, I may have an accident. Even as a vegan, it's rare, but you may have a heart attack. You may have a stroke. So I think it's time that we all grow up and quit having pissing matches and basically say to one another, let's create a health care system that's a health care system that supports you in every way possible. And the money that would be saved and the lives that would be saved, it, uh, it's endless. I can't even imagine. I can't fathom what a difference there'd be. Maybe I'll take a crack on adding something. First of all, like you said, all these tests have risks and can hurt people. Pe people could have their colon perforate, perforated with a colonoscopy. You know. And the question is, have you been eating an American diet your whole life, and are you at risk of getting colon cancer? Is that risk of having your colon perforated worth it, or getting an infection from a colonoscopy worth it? Probably, if you're eating the American diet, it's probably better to find the polyps and remove them. You should get a colonoscopy. But am I going to get a colonoscopy? No way would I ever get a colonoscopy. We heard you liked them. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to take that risk. I've been eating on. I've been eating a healthy diet since I'm a teenager. Since I've been in, in my. Since I was 10 years old. I'm never going to. I would never get a. So I'm saying, why would I take that risk of a colonoscopy? No way. Yes. You know. Yes. Um, so it has to be individualized to a person's risk. Number one, and number two, you have to have a realistic expectation of what the test can do, and that mammograms simply don't detect early stage cancers. They detect cancers that can be seen by you and I that have been there more than 10 years already, that are now most likely, if they are a cancer, they're most likely metastasized already, and they're not gonna, and mammograms, if you look at the independent analysis, don't have a significant effect at overall extending lifespan in, in the population. But we have a whole new wave of tests that are gonna be coming out in the next five years, which is liquid biopsies, gonna be able to detect cancer in their early stages, maybe 10 years before a mammogram can. And then people are gonna left with the, op with the option of what do I do? Have my breast cut off or have my colon removed or what are we gonna do? Have everybody We're gonna find out that this is why mammograms don't matter that much, is because almost all women in America over the age of 50 have breast cancer already. And the mammogram doesn't pick it up. So I can assure you, if you're concerned about that, and men come to me, they say, my PSA is, is high. Should I worry about colon cancer? I'm sure about, oh, excuse me, prostate cancer? I say, just assume you have prostate cancer. And let's try to reverse it. Exactly. Because you probably, well, most men are gonna <coughs> have it. Just because the test doesn't show it doesn't mean you don't have it. Just because your mammogram is clean doesn't mean you don't have breast cancer. You probably, if you're eating American food, you, you're, and you're over the age of 50, you probably have breast cancer anyway. So in other words, these tests that have come out in, in the years to come are gonna show that so many people have cancer, they don't realize it. And we're not gonna treat these cancers with chemotherapy. They're too early on. We're not gonna cut off everybody's breasts. And we're, what we need to do is get people eating right because early stage cancer is a reversible condition. So whether you have the test or not isn't the main question even. You know, the test is, the, the main question is, why aren't you living a lifestyle to prevent these diseases to begin with? That's the most important thing. But, not but, but, but the problem here is, and everything he says is a million percent true, is the doctor doesn't know to tell you that. Right. So when do we almost, how do we get it so that we have lifestyle medicine doctors are not a group of 8,000 doctors who have to cloister together and pat each other on the back? That, that's mainstream medicine. When do we get, you know when we get there? When you, the public, worldwide demands it. That's when we get there. And until you demand it, that's going to be what you get. So certainly we're saying here that your health is in your control 
and don't rely on the medical profession to diagnose you with these diseases when they're already very advanced and then have it reversed. That's not the time to do it. The time to do it is fix your life right now and prevent yourself from getting sick. Yeah. Uh, I've been following both of you for decades, actually. This is my first time having you in the same room. So when I listen to you and it's, eat all raw, which I love when I listen to you, then the next time I'm saying you, you have to eat, cook your mushrooms and your beans. So the question I have every time is, how do I decide which to do? Because <laughs> I guess I go to all these doctors who treat, say, vegan, but different ways of doing it. I think we're all saying the same thing. I, I don't think that Dr. Furman would ever disagree that if you sprout it, it becomes a plant, you could eat it. But I do agree that if you took a bean the way I ate beans my whole life, cook them, you've got to break the, that fibrous structure down. So it's true. And by the way, occasionally I eat cooked beans. You know, I don't walk on water yet. <laughs> right. Um, you know, I don't think there's, we know that cooked beans products extend human lifespan, allow us to live 100 years old. They're excellent foods. I don't think you should be fearful of them. Yeah. In other words, we can e eat cooked foods moderately. We still recommend a tremendous value to eating raw foods and having and eating a lot of raw foods each day. And I think that you're going to be super healthy and it's a sustainable diet that you can live with for the rest of your life. You can stay with it consistently. You maintain a stable weight. You can maintain your muscle strength. You can be excited about your life. and leaves you an unbelievable amount of recipes that you can create that taste delicious and still sustain a sustainable diet that can be, that can be really um, fun and enjoyable your whole life. But if you eat a lot of cooked beans, you may not have a lot of friends. <laughs> <laughs> anything, anything that you can improve, you know, going from American sad standard diet, anything you improve is going to get you healthier. Any little baby step that you take is great. And, and I think I'll, I'll add one thing. I think that, that we need to remember that there's a, a sort of a spectrum of plant-based diets. At one end of the spectrum, you have a, a, you know, the, the pure 100% raw food diet. At the other, the more conventional vegan diet that includes cooked and processed foods and all sorts of things. And at the, at the one end, at the, the, you know, so completely raw vegan diet, this is um, a potentially highly therapeutic diet. It's very clean. There are no processed foods included. But the risk of some nutritional deficiencies will be a little bit higher because you're not including some of the foods that may have added nutrients and so forth. At the other end, your risk of having a potentially um, a, a, a diet that can contribute to disease is a little bit higher. And so where you fit on the spectrum depends on a number of things. What your state of health is, what your age is, uh, what your physical activity is like. And so for some, for young children, for example, uh, including more of the foods that will fill their stomach with less volume can be very valuable in helping to ensure that they grow and develop properly. For someone with serious disease, you want to get closer to eating a really clean diet. So for most really healthy people who are exercising and having a balance of foods where you're eating plenty of raw foods, but including the healthiest of cooked foods like the legumes and the mushrooms and perhaps some grains, uh, where they're, you're not exposing them to really high temperatures, cooking them in healthy ways, that can be a, an excellent diet for long-term health maintenance. So I think we just need to remember that it really depends on individual factors, what diet will best yeah. suit you and your family at whatever stage you're at. Well, I think the first thing I ever heard Brenda say that I disagree with is that this end of the diet, there's possibilities of things that lack. I would disagree with that. I think that we have the least possibility of lacking anything on a, on a Hippocrates type of diet. Now, what I do agree is, by the way, we tell people who are well, they can eat cooked food. And by the way, the same cooked foods that you're talking about, I eat cooked food, Anna Marie eats cooked food, and you know, it's, but when you're fighting cancer, when you're fighting some catastrophic disease, 
Our 62 years of experience and clinical research on people show that that's what it requires. And frankly, it may not require 100% of the people to do that. You have somebody sitting in front of you that had stage 4 cancer. Sloan gave him up to die. He had colitis his entire life. He's from here. He's from Long Island. He got completely well because he was 100% raw. Now, there are some people within that group, and we don't know who these people are, nor am I going to experiment, that may have been okay and may have been perfectly fine if they ate a 70% raw food diet. But what we've seen and what we know from what we've watched now since 1956 is when you're 100%, the likelihood you're going to get well from these dramatically increase. Does everyone get well? No, not everyone gets well because there's psychological factors, there's a million other factors. And let me qualify the statement. So what I'm basing it on is the studies that have compared uh, raw food vegans versus other vegans. And for example, B12 status, it, it tends to be, at least from the studies that I've seen, the lowest in the raw vegans. The opposite is true. Oh, no. You Absolutely. Okay. I'll show you uh. dozens of studies. The lowest levels, and I, 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 I'll just pull them out. They're, I've got them listed in my book. Kay. But raw vegans, because, and maybe not those that are following your program, exactly. but often they just ignore B12. Okay, let, and let me, so they're not, they're not including something, whereas a person eating a conventional vegan diet, for example, in the Adventist Health Study too, what we see in the, in the Adventists is their B12 status is excellent, whereas the people in Europe, the vegans, their, their B12 status is much lower because they don't eat as many fortified food, B12 fortified foods. And so in the raw community, because they're not consuming the fortified foods, we see iodine being a problem in some, we see B12 and vitamin D, whereas in people that consume these fortified foods, we see higher levels when we look at the studies comparing these different populations. And that's not saying that you can't ensure adequate amounts of these things on a raw food diet. Absolutely you can, but just in general population studies, that's w what we generally well, see. Well, you've clarified. Let, let's explain it to you, that the raw food title encompasses many recreational food people. For instance, one of the hardest things I have to do as a, as a leader in raw food is go to a raw food restaurant and act like I like to eat that food. I don't like to eat the food. It's, it's nasty, it's loaded with sugar, it's mostly fruit, and why you have a B12 deficiency in that group is because unripened fruit will rape the body of any B vitamins, and, and certainly the bacteria B12. On the other hand, iodine deficiencies aren't a problem with us because algae is part of the program. Okay. On the other hand, when you look at B12, look at the Dr. Fontana study. And this should be really the most relevant thing to this conversation. Why we have less B12 deficiencies than vegans, because vegans cook their food. When you cook a bacteria, B12 is not a B vitamin. It's a soil-based microorganism. We don't cook our food. I cook some, but you know, 70-80% of my diet, 85% is, we get that bacteria. So look at the Fontana study, uh, Univer Washington University, and, but it was, they looked at us. They didn't look at people eating high fruit diets, recreational diets, and most vegans, as you pointed out earlier, they're eating recreational diets. My original vegan diet, so I had no money, was I get five loaves of white bread, this is not a joke, for a dollar, I got pretzels for 19 cents, and I forget what it cost, you know, that horrible yellow color mustard for 12 cents a bottle. And I'd put mustard, I'd put pretzels, and I had pretzel sandwiches. <laughs> now, what a vegan diet was to me is don't eat meat and don't eat dairy food. Now, if I continued on that, I wouldn't be here today. <laughs> well, look, I, I just want to clarify a couple things that people take, you know, but are cautious. Yeah. First of all, I don't think that's the main issue, which diet has more B12 or not anyway, because yeah. we have to make sure nobody's deficient in B12. Take B12. <laughs> so either take B12, take your blood test, make sure you're not deficient in B12. We're all a little different. We all utilize B12 differently. And whether you, know, whether you have fortified foods or not, I don't eat any fortified foods, but I'm going to make sure I take enough B12. And the other is, sure, is a lot of raw foodists are on fruitarian raw food yeah. diets, and I've taken care of this population for many, many years and seen them lose their hair and lose their teeth, their exactly. nails get weak, and their increased risk of infection, die and have pneumonias and things like that to the poor immune system function on an all-fruit diet. And, and also, um, I want to just mention that the inclusion of some cooked foods in the diet 
low, increased your defenses against cancer, and I've have just as I've got patients who've recovered from cancer, and you know, just like we talked about, for example, using cooked mushrooms in the diet. The lack of that mushrooms have tremendous power against cancer, and you have to eat them cooked. You should eat them cooked. Oh, you bring in pizza for us? <laughs> That's what we need. <laughs> <laughs> Glog up our head. Vegan pizza? Mm -hmm. I don't eat cooked. I don't eat cooked flour product. I don't eat pizza. <laughs> I don't eat vegan pizza junk food. Remember, a lot of these okay. people in the first space. <laughs> that would have been the best food I ate at one point. That's, that <laughs> that's you know. Anyway, but the, the point is, is that um, a vegan diet has the potential to be deficient in certain nutrients, and it's your responsibility to make sure that you're not deficient in anything. Don't rely on your nutritional guru to take care of you. It's your responsibility to make sure you're covered and getting all the nutrients you need. And Every those nutrients that are somewhat marginal based on how you eat and what you eat or could be vitamin D and B12 and DHA and iodine and zinc and maybe, maybe K2. Those are maybe the marginal nutrients that are not high on a vegan diet, but it's your responsibility to know that and to make sure, particularly vitamin D, B12, and DHA are the nutrients that most vegans will develop problems with. And I've taken care of this vegan community for decades and, know to, and see people develop problems on a vegan diet because of these, mostly because of fatty acid deficiencies and DHA yeah, deficiencies yeah. On, a, on a vegan diet. Um, so let's preface this when we say you've got to be cautious on the vegan diet. You've got to be much more cautious on the American diet, on the macrobiotic diet. I mean. True. We're, yeah, we're just giving the science that we see on this. And, and one way to test it is uh, called spectra cell test, and that is actually a uh, nutrition deficiency test. And you'd be amazed how many meat eaters are lacking B12, thinking that they actually have it. We've tested a lot of uh, live food vegans and with no deficiency, but we, as a rule, we put everybody on B12. Yeah. That's the only supplement I'll tell you I want you all on. So let me let me ask a let me let me ask a Spectra cell. Some so of your insurances pay for this. Yeah. Just don't let the average holistic doctor interpret it, because yeah. they're going to tell you to eat salmon and, or something like this. I, I've tried to use Spectra cell for years, and I tried to correlate it with regular blood tests to see if it was accurate, and I found it to be grossly inaccurate, and not not to be. I couldn't rely on it consistently because you get a B12 level on the spectra cell versus one on the regular blood test, they wouldn't concur, a vitamin D level wouldn't concur, a B6 of thiamine wouldn't concur. I, I just felt it was not an accurate enough test for me to be dependent on its results. But if you look at the Framingham people, they tell us that mainstream, we do both. Right, you do both? Everyone does B12. The mainstream blood test for B12 is not accurate. Well, that's what we do in MMA. Yeah, well that, then it's different, then we get to cost factors with this, yeah. yeah. But still, I mean, it's, you gotta be careful. Because so it, it, it comes up with people who are deficient or reading perfectly healthy sometimes. You can tell them they, they need more B1 or thiamine, and you know true. that's just not it's true. true. Yeah. So, 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 the, so let me go on. The, you so use the main a crystal ball. <laughs> <laughs> so the main question that I'd like to go forward with is, so assume someone reads your books, listens to your lectures, and says, I'm in. I'm 100% plant-based, whole food, doing exactly what you say. So now that you've seen these people for the last 40 years, will this completely prevent heart attacks, cancer, diabetes, Alzheimer's, does it reduce it by 5%, 10%? Like, you know, if someone says, you know, it's, it's, it's gonna take a lot of time and effort, it's gonna change my life, what's the payoff? Are you saying that we're gonna reduce, like I feel like I don't smoke cigarettes and I feel a, on my chances of lung cancer are way less. So how much less for the person in this room that says, I'm in, I'm doing it 100% like you say, how much less is their chance of heart disease, cancer, diabetes, Alzheimer's, kidney disease, and throw in 10 more diseases. Every disease you mentioned is a minimum double digits, double digits. But why everyone that comes to us gets psychotherapy, that's a major factor. If you don't change your attitude about your life, first it's hard to maintain a healthy lifestyle, and that's a factor we have to see. So to preclude other factors, your environment, you have a great marriage, you like your job, would be sort of silly. But at the same point, I don't know one study that's ever been serious that looked at diet, vegan diets and catastrophic disease that didn't show remarkable differences. Prolonged life. Look at the 
studies that were done out in Loma Linda. What was a what was the twelve year difference in lifespan just by a, not even a great vegan diet, you know, make believe meat diet they were looking at, and so overwhelming data shows us that we don't have to look very far to see that. I agree. I go to Loma Linda and I see it. It's amazing how poor the diet is of the Seventh-day Adventists <laughs> who get 12 years of extra lifespan because they're eating a junk food vegan diet, mostly with a lot of fake meats and a lot of, you know, I'm looking at what they're eating. I'm saying this isn't anywhere near a healthy diet and they're still getting these benefits. Exactly. So I'm agreeing 100%. But of course, um, the, the direct answer to your question is, what's the decreased risk of lung cancer you get comparing a non-smoker to a smoker. No. What's the decreased risk? Are you half the risk of lung cancer? Are you one hundredth the risk of lung cancer? Are you one thousandth the risk of lung cancer? Which is it? Do you know? I don't know. I don't know. It's one thousandth well, the risk. So it's, you know, very, so the answer is how, what's your risk of, and also, what, what age did you start living healthfully? So I would say that there are countries around the world, like the Catawba Island studies, where you have islands which never had heart disease, and don't have heart disease in their ancestry. They don't even eat a perfect diet. You know, heart disease just simply doesn't have to happen if you start eating a healthy diet at a young enough point. If you wait till your heart is really damaged and you have a lot of disease present, it's not going to be a 100% guarantee. But yes, a healthy diet, a really super, truly healthy diet should be totally protective against heart disease in almost everybody except for an incredibly rare person with some genetic defect in apoprotein or a genetic defect in heart function or yeah. very, very rare diseases. We're talking about probably less than one in a, th may, way less than one in a thousand who started this diet. If you had my children who eating healthy since a young age, you know, and you know, I know I have no risk of heart disease. I'm never gonna have a heart attack or a stroke. I can say that right now. It's not something you worry, have to worry about. And that's the beauty of this because you don't have to live with fear. You know, with regard to cancer risk, it's a little different because your risk is affected by what you ate for the first 50 years of your life. It's even the first 20 years of your life, but the longer you eat healthfully, the more that risk goes down. Just like you quit smoking and younger, and the longer you stay away from cigarettes, the risk goes down. And of course, that's why we're advocating a diet that seems so excellent, that seems uh, too hard to achieve for many people, because we want to give people a program that really works. And if we gave them a diet that was moderately nutritionally better than what they're eating, it wouldn't reverse the methylation defects. It wouldn't reverse the damage and really dramatically lower the risk of cancer because the damage has already been incurred later in life and it can progress. So we need to give them a diet that's really, truly excellent so we put the power back in your hands so you can control your health destiny and get a really strong decreased risk in these diseases. And I'm convinced that the decreased risk of cancer from eating a really healthy diet, even when it's adapted after the age of 50, will be more than an 80% drop in cancer it's risk. Be. It's got to be, because we it's see that be. even in studies where people just eat green vegetables you and mushrooms, they drop at seven. If they just you eat have. greens and green tea and mushrooms, they drop at 84%. That's you right. know, so we, and even with people who have cancer, drop the risk of death from in the 60s and 70s, we eat a really healthy diet. So we know we can drop the risk dramatically. Probably, in, even in people not eating healthily who adopt a healthy eating, we're seeing, we're thinking like 90% or more drop in cancer occurrence risk. So we're talking about dramatic changes in these diseases that afflict Americans. Uh, Ren, do you remember that it was recently, about three years ago, I forget, a study that was done how rapidly it happens. It doesn't take months or years, it, it's weeks. Do you remember uh, that study? Absolutely, and I, and I can say with my own work in the Marshall Islands, that was probably the most shocking part for me, is how rapidly the changes happened. And we had people who had had pain in their legs, you know, in intermittent claudication and that where they couldn't walk across a room and they had had it for 15, 20 years in some cases, in a week it was gone. Um, the changes can happen very, very rapidly. I w it reminds me of a, of, a, of a diabetic who was in California. He was in um, Kaiser Permanente Insurance Company going to see his podiatrist and he was going to have his leg amputated. He had to have his foot amputated due to gangrene or an early gangrene due to his diabetes. And the person, the man with diabetes started crying and said, I don't really want to have my leg amputated. Isn't there anything I could do to save my leg? And the doctor threw up his hand and said, I don't know, why don't you see Steve, the Dr. Steve below it. He's into this crazy diet that helps people reverse diabetes. Maybe it'll help you, you know. So of course the guy's leg comes back and he, and he saves his leg. But he wasn't even gonna mention the diet that he could go on a diet and save his leg or even do anything about his diabetes. He was just gonna surgery and operate and cut off his leg. He wouldn't have mentioned that until the guy started crying and telling him, isn't there begging the doctor, isn't there anything I could do, anything I could possibly do that may help me. So go, go to the weirdo leg. downstairs. Yeah, yeah. the guy downstairs, <laughs> right, and say, you know. But, but what we see this all the time. We see people with 
very serious conditions and very advanced disease processes, pathologies that still get better and reverse these diseases. So there, it is tremendously hopeful for even people who've eaten poorly and have disease. And it is tremendously protective. And I always make the statement that eating right is a hundred times, at least a hundred times more protective against future heart attacks than taking cholesterol-lowering drugs and, and taking blood pressure no. medications. This, it's not a compar no comparison at all. The, 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 the blessing that Anna and I have had, I, I, I assume both of you have had, after everything else fails, people show up at a place like Hippocrates. I mean, they are desperately sick, and we watch them in a matter of three-week period transform. I mean, if you came to a graduation, you would honestly think we had professional actors from Hollywood <laughs> getting up and telling lies every week. Because, you know, like every once in a while, somebody sits in the room and says to us, come on, <laughs> you know, come on. We just had a woman, I was in Boston speaking, and it took 25 minutes before they w could introduce me, because we had person after person stand up and talk about how they healed. And one woman, this is a scary story, she didn't even have cancer, she had pre-cancer, dysplasia. And they said, we have to do a uh, radical mastectomy on both breasts, mm -hmm. we have to immediately put you on chemotherapy, and <coughs> she said, y you know, you can't, you know, I don't want to do that. And somebody, her neighbor said, go to Hippocrates, comes, this is in April she comes to us. I lecture there in October, completely free of this. And I said, what did the doctor say? She went back to the same doctor. He said, I must have made a mistake. She said, well, how about if I listened to you? I wouldn't have any breast. I'd have chemotherapy. You know, it is a bizarre world, just like this guy. They're going to cut his leg off. And here's a guy two seconds away downstairs. If he drilled a hole, he could drop into that place. <laughs> it's a, it, you know. But it's not that we have to make them wrong. I feel bad for them. I actually feel more compassion today, after 48 years of doing this work for doctors and the profession than I've ever had before. I think it's time that we, we love and hug them and say everything's okay and let's work together and let's put patients first. Patients first. Not egos and profits and ideologies and all this nonsense that we waste time on. Good evening. Um, so considering the fact that uh, cancer rates are increasing, according to the World Health Organization, one in two men are going to have cancer and die within their lifespan, and one in three women are going to have cancer and die within their lifespan. And we have heart attacks killing about 3,000 Americans every day. What branch of medicine do you think can accept plant-based nutrition and use it as a primary defense in face of the diseases? And I'm asking as a medical graduate? Well, I hope it starts with general practitioners. They see the most people. What type of specialty? Oh, oh, cardiology, nice. for sure. Well, yeah. I personally became a, I went to University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine, and I became a board-certified family physician because I wanted to have the access to care for every patient who came to me. Children with type 1 diabetes, I wanted to take care of the elderly. I didn't want to have to turn people away. Women with gynecologic problems, I wanted menopausal issues. I wanted to make sure I could care for all people because nutrition is so effective across the broad spectrum of diseases. If I, and it's so exciting to be able to take care of everybody and with all these problems again and have them reverse themselves. So I'd be an advocate for you following in my footsteps. You know. <laughs> and the other thing to know is that lifestyle medicine is really becoming a specialty, and there's now a board certification exam by the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. You can get board certified in lifestyle medicine. In Lithuania, they have a lifestyle medicine master's program and a three-month uh, elective for physicians in lifestyle medicine. And so I think that if you know you have that interest, regardless of your specialty, whether you're you know, an oncologist or a, a cardiologist or an endocrinologist or a family doctor, to get that certification in lifestyle medicine just, it, it's, yeah. it's part of every single specialty of, of medicine. And it's conducted in English, by the way. It costs pennies and it's can go over for the summer. Yeah. Even if you become an internist, you get a general, you know, general internal medicine 
you could still proceed with getting your specialty in lifestyle medicine on top of that and take care of all adult diseases and you don't want to take care of, you know, so we like little, I think that's, you know, you take something, as it parallels to being just an oncologist or cardiologist, because now you can have brought in the amount of people you can care for. Okay, last question. I'm just gonna ask a quick question. Oh, sorry, I'm sorry. Hi, so six years ago, sorry. Uh, six years ago, I went to the Hippocrates Institute. Uh, I was diagnosed with a cancerous tumor and uh, Thanks to Brian and Anna Maria, uh, it, it's, it was, I was able to get rid of it without surgery, chemo, or radiation. And, uh, but when I returned home, thank you, and I, at six years, I've been living this lifestyle ever since. And, but when I returned home, it was the combination of Dr. Furman and, and what Hippocrates taught me. So I am looking at the presence of my greatest heroes tonight. So. Um, Steve, thank you so much for bringing them together. I mean, these four incredible minds here, uh, what a gift uh, to have such lifesavers. But my question is that what probably caused my cancer is I was on medicine for ulcerative colitis for almost 20 years. And uh, the fine <coughs> print on a lot of these medicines is, oh, may cause malignant tumors. And when I've gone back to these gastroenterologists with no symptoms after, you know, 20 something years of saying I'd, had, I'd be on this medicine the rest of my life, they literally don't, they're not at all interested in my story. And it's so significant, I mean, they just say, oh, did you do that holistic thing? I mean, they, they could care less. And, I mean, gastroenterologists, I get it, the cancer, they, they're, they're putting their license at risk if they, you know, fought, you know, start recommending this and people die, but, but gastroenterology, that's digestion. Like, why is nutrition not emphasized as their backbone? I mean... They don't even think dentistry has it. Your mouth has anything yeah. to do with the body. You know, it's, it's <laughs> all, the, every day, all the time, the person comes back, their psoriasis is gone. Their psoriatic is resolved. They go, they come back, see the doctor, and the, the rheumatologist is yelling at them and throwing them out of the office. The patient <laughs> comes back to me crying and saying, he threw me out of the office and I want to show him how it got better. Yeah. They threw him out. Yeah. You know, it was like they were angry they got better. That's exactly. I, 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 I can't figure, can't, yeah. So when you got well, at Sloan Kettering, the oncologist threw you out of the office? No, he was, he was actually a doctor. A local guy. Yeah. Okay. It or they say to a patient sometimes, oh, are you going to just eat rabbit food the rest of your life? Yeah. That's what they say. <laughs> you have to come. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah, it's, uh, sometimes they're threatened by this because they're not experts in it. And now their egos are threatened because they had nothing to do with it. They know their little particular information, what they know, and now you didn't get well from what they told you to do. It makes them look bad, and they're just going to just try to, you know, cognitive dissonance. They just want to push it away and not to think about it, so get out of here. But, but when you look at oncology or colitis or Crohn's disease, they have zero success rate in most cancers. I shouldn't say zero. They have about a 7% success rate. That's what the medical journals report to us. So long-term survivals are 7%. And when it comes to colitis, every single doctor is going to tell you that it's chronic. You'll have it for the rest of your life. How many people I've seen get rid of colitis? It's like shocking. On a raw diet, <laughs> the opposite of what they're telling you. Don't eat raw food. Everything has to be blended. We blend it, but cooked. I mean, it's, it's outrageous. But how we have to change it is not just look at how insane that whole thing is. Is we have to hug them. We have to tell them we understand. We have to tell them we love them, that we know you're failing all of the time. We don't have to say that. We know that there's, <laughs> there's something else that we may offer to this equation. Wouldn't it be nice if you could succeed? More than 7% of the time? Or more than none of the time? Wouldn't it be nice? And I think doctors want to do that. I don't think doctors are bad people. I don't think when they were 18 they schemed, oh, we're going to make money and make people angry. I think they really did it for the right reason. I don't know there's too many charlatans that want to go to school 12 years to make a living. They should drop out and go to Wall Street. That's where you make a living. And so along the way they get corrupted. And if they're in the wrong area of medicine, not ER, they do great work. Oncology. Uh, Orthopedic surgery. These are the big, big failures. They're sort of jokes within the medical community. You know, doctors laugh about these guys because they s fail so often. We've got to embrace them and tell them it's okay. You know, I gave a lecture just a few weeks ago to a 30, ortho 30 oncologists, all oncolo local young oncolo oncologists, and they're working at, and they, 
and they were very fascinated and interested and asked me very intelligent questions. They were excited about this and they wanted to start a cancer survivorship program at the hospital. And they said to me, here's what we have to offer the patients. We can give them a drug, like a chemotherapeutic agent for most common cancers, and the drug will, will cost about $300,000 a year and will on the average extend their lifespan <laughs> three to six months. That's the average, and they recognized it and they know they have very little in their toolbox. But this is what they've learned and this is what they have to offer people and this is what people want because that's all people can get. And so among themselves, I think those oncologists, those 30 oncologists, all change their diets and they're all eating healthy now and they're all excited about this information. And the regular people, just like everybody else, but they just don't know any better and they, have, they use what they have available to them. And just like everybody, all other humans, they have their insecurities and their egos and everything else. And you know, so what you're saying is true that a lot of doctors are changing and want to learn this information. We have to be embracive to everybody. So there's a whole world out there of people that can support you, especially in, in your endeavor in medicine and be open to, you know, like we're not chiropractors, but we work with chiropractors. We work with so many therapists that are helping us in our work, because, you know, we are so much into the nutrition, psychology, we have amazing psychologists that are working with us, and I can't picture me and Brian sitting doing that everything, so you can't do everything, but you need to have people around you that can support your work and so a doctor can't, of course, cannot be the one that would know everything, but be totally open. But that system has to start from the top. It has to start from the professors that are making the programs at the universities. It has to start from there. And like Brenda said, of course, you're, uh, you're catered by uh, all kinds of pharmaceutical uh, um, um, Representative. representatives, and you're, you know, you're schmoozed by them, and of course they want you to sell what they have. So it has to change, and I think what happens is that people have to choose by their wallet. So the more that you choose what you want to have, the doctors, the kind of care that you want to have, that's going to change it. And there's nothing else that's going to change it. It's your own wallet. It's your insurance. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Stephen. Thank Great you very day. much. I want to thank you all.